Hello, everyone on the world. This is a cry for help. No, this is Subpixel's Game of the Year 2022, as we learned in the pre-show. Uh, joining me, the other members of, members of Subpixel, we've got Ian Gibson. You know, we're past 100 episodes now, and no joke, you nail every intro in some unique way, and that is <laughs> honestly very impressive. You know, you got to keep it fresh in this environment of uh, sameness. Yeah, let's go to Kyle. Let's go to Kyle. Yeah, you can't do it twice <laughs> in the same app. It doesn't work. Yeah, I heard you say Membles, and I was I was very into that new pronunciation <laughs> of that word. So, Membles. yeah, it was good. It was good. I'm my glad. I'm glad Membles. I was here to witness a new a new word being formed. It's my home star runner impression. I was really just <laughs> a next job. Uh, we've also got. Well, that was. Kyle Bailey. I keep wanting to say Kyle Gibson. I don't know why. You two get married already. You just really... <laughs> do you want to write some fan fiction? Like, is I think this... I do. Oh, boy. God. That's next oh, next boy. extra life. <laughs> yeah, Jake Terrio <laughs> will write the next fan fiction entry. Mm. The, the pregnancy of Kyle and Ian. Oh, uh, God. Wait. Both of us. Both of us. Both, <laughs> both of you simultaneously. Well, that's what 60... No. Well, anyways, that's what, folks. That's, how, that's where twins come from. <laughs> The movie, not actually just, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. Yeah, Daniel DeVito. Oh, we all went for the joke. It's a great um, movie. Ian Gibson, would you like to describe how we are doing this for Game of yes, the Year? But, but first, I'm going to give you a spoiler warning. Uh, oh, yes. Everything is on the table for this. I, I think we'll, we'll probably also give spoiler warnings as we hit things, just to, to tell you when to skip ahead if you want to miss stuff. But uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's a lot of games here that I have not fully discussed this year with anybody on the Subpixel staff because I was holding it in for Game of the Year. And there's a lot of decent spoilers you can have in here. Uh, so spoiler warning. But second of all, the process. Uh, I am looking at in front of me a short list of 22 games that we have compiled throughout the year, as well as uh, having an informal top 10 vote from each of us that was uh, thankfully compiled by Karen, friend of the site. We have 22 games, and I am proposing a three-part process, gentlemen. The first part is before we discuss any games at all, we cut this list of 22 down to 15, the 15 games that we think could potentially make the top 10. Then once we have that 15, we then go through one by one at random. You know, we'll go kind of round robin. One person will pick a game. We'll discuss it for a couple minutes, highs, lows, what we liked about it, what we didn't. And then we'll put it on the list. The list is, has no numbers yet. It is just a list. So the first game goes first on the list. The second game we say, is it better or worse than the other games on the list? And we just get a rough ordering of the 15 games. Then the third process, we decide debate and finalize the top 10 with numbers what do you guys think about that process i like it. okay yeah okay uh, i'm done will would you like to read out from top to bottom the 22 right now this is again a rough ordering but it is from most liked across the site to least liked yes so number one currently is pentiment uh followed by elden ring vampire survivors cult of the lamb the Case of the Golden Idol, Tiny Kin, Nobody Saves the World, Citizen Sleeper, Hard Space Ship Breaker is tied with Signalis. Next is Neon White. Then Tunic tied with TMNT Shredder's Revenge. Then Stray. Then Dwarf Fortress Steam. Gran Turismo 7 is tied with Norco. Card Shark is tied with the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Before Your Eyes, and then Pokemon Legends Arceus tied with the quarry. Let's um, just cut both those two right now. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in the list, uh, there is a double dashed horizontal line. That is the 15. So let me just ask the tough question off the top. The bottom seven. Is anybody upset if we cut those bottom seven from the list? No. <sighs> Yes. That's great. I would I would maybe swap Card Shark with Stray, but that would be the only change I'd make. Ooh. I mean, I wouldn't want to... I mean, I'm 100% with getting rid of Stray, but I wouldn't immediately... I, I, wouldn't immediately I am fine cut. with swapping. So, I mean, I don't know. I like Stray, so... Let's do this. Let's make it easy. Let's just go with the top 16. So it's the top 15 plus Card Shark, and let's discuss oh, from there. Turismo. I'm surprised you're not... 
There's a lot of great games on here. That's fine. Uh, okay. All right. So let me do this. Uh, I'm going to strike these through. Um, Will, would you like to pick the first game out of the 16 we have listed to discuss? Uh, so you give a little intro, then we're all going to discuss it, and then you propose a spot on the list for it. Oh, God. Um, man. Tinykin, guys. Tinykin <clears throat> is one of those games that I couldn't put down and I 100%ed. Um, literally 100%ed, other than the new DLC they put out. It... I've only 100%ed a few games, one of them being Fallout 3, another one of them being Tomb Raider, the, uh, the revival in 2011. Uh, and I'm sure there's other games on there, but Tinykin is so good. The music is incredible. It's all the levels are well put together. It doesn't have a fast travel mechanic or a level ch choosing thing, which annoys me. The gameplay is fantastic. It's just like Pikmin. I've heard from others. <coughs> um, it feels great. It flows great. Again, the music, the instruments change where you are in the level. So if you like jump inside the guitar, it's like a very guitar version of it. If you go up higher, as you get close to the stereo, the like band version, stereo rock band version takes over. If you go inside a place like the church, it's all the bugs singing at the altar and everything just does that with every single level. It's a perfect game, which is why it should be like number four on the list. Uh, well, no, it will be number it will be at the top of the list because remember yeah, we're not be doing numbers because you recommended it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Can, oh, sorry, I forgot we're cutting fifteen to ten. It should be in the top. Yeah, 10. yeah. Um, Tinykin for me is it's it's weird. It's for me it's a dichotomy about this game when I think about it because number one, Tinykin is doing absolutely nothing brand new. Um, it's it's like a it's a combination of a three D platformer plus Pikmin. It is not doing anything particularly innovative or unique. But that being said, everything it is doing is almost to perfection. And a lot of what it's doing is not popular right now. 3D platformers, even with Super Mario Odyssey and Ukulele and all that, not that popular now, especially compared to when they used to be popular. Uh, the Pikmin genre of you've got little guys with you and you throw them around, you collect them and they do certain things for you. Not popular right now. So Pikmin is one of those games that just comes out of nowhere. It's very easy to explain, but it's almost unbelievable how well designed and implemented it is it, it is a game that is built to perfection not not to be necessarily impressive or new or evolutionary but it is perfection anyone else want to say anything about tinykin i mean i wanted to highlight what you said to me one of the strongest elements is the adaptive music just because that's one of the things that i i keep an eye out for i'm you know music guy um but um yeah i agree solid well put together not necessarily uh, innovating in any regard but um certainly a grand old time i did i think rolled credits on it in just a few sittings like will said it was just kind of you know really yeah. easy to digest and and get through yeah i uh, i have not rolled credits on it yet but i you guys pretty much already said all the highlights of everything i mean it's not super innovative but it's super fun it's really cute um it's just i don't know it's like a good a good time like every time you sit down with it it's just like yeah you know i'm gonna i know the next few hours that i'm playing this are gonna be fun i'm gonna have a smile on my face um and i i liked it yeah cool all right so let me move tinykin over to top of the list can the stream um, see this document or, or are yes. we just okay uh, I will admit, at the, it wasn't until the end of Tinykin that I discovered you could hold the right trigger to just stack the guys underneath you. Mm -hmm. oh, it's such a good feeling. because For it's most so levels, I aimed and threw them and stacked them. And oh, wow. <laughs> wow. No, you got to ele like elevate nightmare. elevator yourself. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's um, let's move on. I'm going to go in the order that I see on the screen clockwise. That would be Jake next. Oh, Ooh, I gotta pick. Uh, okay, I'll maybe I'll pick um because I want to talk more in depth about the other ones. I'll I'll pick a hard space shipbreaker. Um, 
this was one that I had been wanting to play for a while. I think was it in it was in early access for a while and finally got a full release over the summer. Um, yes, I believe it was and, two years in early access. Yeah, and so I had been wanting to play it for two years or however long it had been since the announcement. Um, big fan of of the aesthetic that uh, Bluebird Interactive has cultivated with um, their Homeworld spinoffs and then with this. Um, just a very neat little, like, is it like a reverse puzzle game? Where the puzzle is completed and you yeah. have to take it apart. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, and the 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 layering of like the the danger levels, where then you're like, okay, this one has a nuclear reactor in it, and now this one has an ele- like a big generator in it, and this one has this, and this one has that. Um, just a lot of neat moments of like accidentally explosive decompressing a chamber that you're in, um, and then the narrative is is uh prescient but not necessarily anything you know super you know top shelf writing wise or anything but a good a good story to stitch everything together this very kind of you know workers rights kind of dystopian kind thing. of future yeah dystopian yeah. anti capitalist but i think i think the just to push back a little bit on your storytelling thing mm. dialogue i i understand your complaint but world building is oh, phenomenal and excellent i mean i mean you start the game having to scroll through this just obscene <laughs> contract. Yeah. contract yeah yeah like like that well, game could have they could have very easily just been like look there's dialogue for story segments the rest of it is just a ui showing you things but every yep. opportunity they could ui ux design everywhere they are shoving that theme down your throat and oh, i absolutely good. loved it yeah no yeah. the wor- world building was fantastic um getting to scrounge uh objects off the ships like posters and and yes. dolls and and data tapes stuff that's uh you know your bonus little things where you're like oh yeah this is pretty neat um yeah you know what i'm sorry jake i i do have a bone to pick with your dialogue because okay. your dialogue complaint <laughs> because i'm starting to remember parts of this game and this game got me genuinely upset like when that when the manager shows up and he's mm-hmm. basically like a union buster because there's rumors of unionization so he mm-hmm. shows up and, and he's got like this folksy charm and he's like now folks we got a job to do and it's just like you motherfucker you're a fucking yeah, boomer no, corporate I, I, toad and it's so beautifully written and and even like like i remember like literally just like seething with anger when there's a story beat where basically they rip the rug out from under you and they go hey guess what that contract you signed at the beginning basically says that every time you're when the first time you are cloned you are no longer yourself you are now technically company property mm-hmm. so because of that you are now just an object owned by the company Company. So we're we're not going to pay you anymore. You have no private ownership. That ship that you've been scrounging parts to build the whole time is now company property. It doesn't belong to you anymore. And I got very upset. Like the writing yeah. of that game was actually fantastic. Now that I no, I, it. I I would then make the I would want to make the distinction because I I totally agree with you on all that. I would maybe make the distinction that the the moment to moment writing is not bad by any stretch of the imagination but it's serviceable it's just it's getting it's getting the job done the narrative yeah. o- the overarching narrative excellent fantastic yes. kind of story development yes. and all that um so i would make that distinction but uh, no totally agree with you on all on all those fronts when that when the boss shows up and there was a beat where um you know uh, additional spoiler warning there's like six or seven other um Hutters mm-hmm. at like various other stations in orbit that you can kind of see in the skybox, but you never see these other people. Um, where um, you discover that the boss has the ability to basically like shut your suit down. Um, and if you're, you know, in motion, Newton's laws are such that you'll just, you can't stop yourself if you're in motion and you go. And so there's a moment where you think that one of these other cutters has died because you like hear their comms chatter as their suit is shut down by the boss and you, they like float into the, um, the incinerator or whatnot. Turns out that they did, they were say they saved themselves at the last minute, but that was a, a tense beat. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, Will you played hard space shipbreaker. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I played a little bit. I, I kind of messed up with it. 
where I, I just wanted like a game to play. And so I turned off the timers and everything. And then it was so long between story beats. I never really got into it. Um, so hearing you guys talk about it more, I, I kind of want to go back and play just the regular campaign mode. And now I realize why every time I played, it was like, you should play the campaign mode. Like it told me every single time. So that, that makes a lot more sense. I would, I, I don't know if you guys mentioned this, but the, um, as far as the world building, it opens, or at least in the opening, there's that little girl singing, like it's yes. sort of like national like a, anthem. Yeah. Yes. So and good. It's so good. It's, and from that moment. I was like into it. I think it's a a, a play on the like the sailor's prayer yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. for like sailors that die at sea. But it's uh, like for the you know the ship cutters in orbit. Yeah. It was, it was again great wonderful. world building. Wonderful touch. Yeah. I, and, I mean we no. we talked a, we talked a lot about like the story and everything, but the actual gameplay is very fun and tense oh, yeah. and scrambly when it's mm -hmm. like, oh shit, I didn't realize that this was gonna decompress you talked about the explosive decompression and stuff like that. Like that I mean it it's sort of like gripping when that happens and, and when it's unexpected, especially. But I don't know. I thought I thought the gameplay was was really solid and it it made the experience of of doing the cutting and stuff way more enjoyable but i also like we collectively kind of know someone who worked on this game doc burford um who we did an interview with a while ago um and he has some interesting thoughts about it but overall like it's a solid experience it's, it wasn't my favorite experience like it's definitely definitely more unique uh in in its take and i i can appreciate it for that but i liked it um it was it was solid i think um I feel like we've kind of been dancing around the number one complaint that I had with this game that honestly prevents it from being my number one, not to talk about numbers yet, but I was all on board with this game, except for there's two, there's two flaws. The, I'll start with the minor flaw. We've talked about this before, which is by default, the game has these timers built in. Um, and I believe they're 10 minute timers. Well, well, sorry. So, so there's a timer for your oxygen. So that runs for a couple minutes. And then you constantly have to run to some other, uh, uh, a little kiosk on the side of the arena and and grab more oxygen and then um two point jake there's like a 15 minute shift timer so every 15 minutes oh, yeah. you have to go back to the thing and come back and then there's also a fuel timer they so when they first came out with this game in early access those timers were in there by default and people were complaining because honestly me personally I, that that really sucks i'm i'm in the middle of cutting a ship i don't want to have to deal with these like timers every couple minutes um so you can turn the timers off but then the problem i had in talking to jake about this is the story progresses when you go back into your habitat you go back into your habitat at the end of a shift which is either based on the shift timer or if you turn the timer off it's based on when you complete the ship or whenever you want to save the game because you're done playing so even though i have like 30 hours in this game i never finished the story because i turned the timers off so i was only getting a story beat every 30 to 45 minutes because it's when i was completing a ship so there's there's a big problem with timers in this game where they never really figured out the good middle ground. But the bigger problem, there's not enough ship variety in this game. When it comes down to it, there's basically like five types of ships and they will change a little bit what's on the outside, what's on the inside. They, they may change a little bit what it looks like, but there is just not enough diversity in the ships for me to have like thoroughly enjoyed this game. Mm. I, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about that. No, you... I'd agree. I, I think. Sorry. Will do. You well, I, I'll just make a quick point. Do you think? Do you think this game would? Do you think that would play differently if the game was you and the however many other people, uh, shipbreakers, were working on one big ship together, and you were taking off like the sections of it were the story, rather than a different little ship every time. I, I don't know. I, I think that would be something different because I don't think I would be satisfied if it was one big ship the entire story. Um, I think for me, I just needed more variety because it, it got to the point where I was playing this game. I would wake up early just to do like 45 minutes and do a full ship before I go to work because it was just like the perfect way to start the day. Listen to a podcast, have hard space shipbreaker, just break down a ship. But like I said, I didn't finish this game because the story wasn't progressing fast enough because I had the timers off, but also because I, I got bored of the ships. There is just simply not enough variety. So yeah, you could solve it by having a fewer number of more distinct ships, et cetera, bigger ships, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's like if you're playing a puzzle game and by the time you get to the 20th puzzle, they just start repeating them. 
you know yeah. at some point you, you can't have a puzzle game that repeats puzzles that's yeah. not doable uh, my the only reason i suggested that is just because um i feel like the shifts would make more sense then you're like oh i did a shift on the big ship and you would be more apt to keep those timers yeah. on because you're like, oh, I'm heading back and all that. Anyways, Jake, you were making a point earlier. No, I was going to agree. Yeah, obviously, I, I would love a wider variety of ships because, yeah, it is like a base hull and then a couple of like modified, you know, exterior and interior bits. Um, but um, they were various enough that it helped me get through to the end of the narrative. I did have a game breaking bug at like the second to last story beat that got patched um like a month after the game released on xbox um so then i was finally able to finish it so that was frustrating that there was a there was a pretty a pretty huge bug that a lot of people had been experiencing on you know reddit and twitter and all that but that they had to make a specific deliberate patch for but um yeah yeah, no, all all in all. I loved it. But it is very much my brand of of sci-fi yeah. storytelling. Okay. So to move this forward, Jake, you you chose Heart Space Shipbreaker. It's up to you to nominate a spot. Right now there's only two spots. Is it I would, above I would put it or above below Tinykin for me? Above yeah. Tinykin. What what do you Kyle and Will, what do you guys think? Again, this isn't final, but this is a rough placement. I think below tinykin for me i would put it below tinykin i think i think i would go below as well simply because of like the number one problem i had with it which is there is not enough variety <laughs> so sorry Jake. Let's, That's again, like, this i understand <laughs> this, yeah i think all of the games that i nominated this year are ones where i'm like this is just a me game <laughs> this is for me <laughs> Yeah, this is so, actually an so intervention. It, yeah. So again, just to say it, this is not final, but this gets us to a rough shape. And the third phase is we start fiddling and fine tuning the list. I will um, also say the devs have spoken on the idea of maybe implementing multiplayer at some point. That'd be great. Yeah, that would be. I think if, if multiplayer had existed in this yeah, prior to very now. good. And they that need, would be they very need, fun. They need multiplayer and workshop support. That will solve mm-hmm. problems. That will oh, solve yeah. everything. If people can mod their own ships in yeah. for greater ship variety. I oh, mean, get yeah. the oh, yeah. get the spaceship space engineers people and the yeah. hard space shipbreaker people make mm-hmm. a baby. And the people that don't care about copyrights, because like you know, throw like a Battlestar Galactica Cylon <gasps> ship in there. Hell yeah, An man! AI designed ships. Mm, no. <gasps> Uh, uh, Will, I mean, uh, Kyle, please. It's your turn. Let's pick a pick game a and game. then discuss uh, it. We're going to we're going to start. I, I I mean, I can tell we're we're all kind of straying away a little bit from the, the top five as they are right now. I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to broach that topic yet. So I'm going to nominate uh, TMNT Shredder's Revenge. Um, fantastic game. I'm going to state up front, it's not going to be in like the top five. We all know that. Um, for me, it's equivalent to, I think, how Will feels about Tinykin, where it was just one of those games that it just did everything right for me. I just had a smile on my face the entire time. I was thinking about playing the original arcade game when I was growing up and just how how much of a worthy sequel and a worthy follow-up it is to that game. Um the controls are tight. It's fun. You can do up to six player uh, co-op, which is amazing. There's like so many people on the screen that you can't even really tell what's happening, but it's it's kind of fun in that like Smash Brothers way with just like chaos. Um, it's really it just did everything right for me. And the the music on top of it, the soundtrack is so good. Like it's such a killer soundtrack. Um, I'm also just a big uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, if you couldn't tell. Um, so I have to you know, I, I got to stand up for my boys and uh, they I, I think they did the, the team behind it just did a really good job. Again, not revolutionizing anything. They're just doing something that they chose really well. Um, and and I think that it's worthy to at least be somewhere in the bottom of the top 10. Um, but that's that's where that's where I'll I'll stake my 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 claim. Um, I will say I this is one that I have maybe the the least experience with of all the games this year, but I did, we Kyle, you and I played it on stream. Yes. At extra life. 
Yes. Um, and yeah, I agree with with all that you said. I I don't have any knowledge of like the arcade the the previous versions of this, um, mm-hmm. or really much knowledge of the the Turtles mythos in general. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with it at whatever it was four or five in the morning. It was very um, uh, <laughs> late slash early. Yeah, um, <laughs> I will say my if I uh, just because the contrarian has left the stream, so I'll be the contrarian for a second. <laughs> um, there was don't let that, it bring you down. That weird truck boss fight yes we just had to kind of like i force i did find out how to beat that like oh, yeah. effectively like i had to look it up i also think that it was because we were exhausted at that it point that we, it, it's actually very obvious how you do it but we, oh, we okay. neither neither of us were were doing that so i'm i'm gonna blame that one on okay. just the fact that we were it was 5 a.m <laughs> like hour 19 of of 24 so yeah but yeah yeah, uh, I have not played uh, this Mr. TMNT's Shedder, Shredders. Shredders. Oh um, I have not played to, it. Do you want me to take over from here, Will? Yeah, if you could, <laughs> I just have to sober up, maybe. <laughs> I, uh, so I, I played about an hour of it. Um, I enjoyed it. Like, I love the idea of making new old games where you, you basically take uh, an existing game style. hasn't been done in a while. It's an old game and you just go, hey, let's just make that again. And it's crazy because you play it and it's the old game, but it's also like 4K. E- e- even the simple stuff like the animations and, and, and all that stuff is just like tripled in like emphasis it's how and style. you remember it yeah it's funny yeah. going going back to it's play great. the old game is so slow like the, yes. it just it feels so like it's lagging this one is really snappy um it's it's snappy but it's fluid like you were talking about the animations they did such a good job of characterizing everyone in really specific yep. anima animatory ways and anim- animated ways um it's really easy to follow your character and you you get to learn like just their fight style through their movements they all run a different way like i don't know i i love stuff like that so it, it's a big leap forward but yeah again it's doing it's just doing what the 90s game did now so yeah so that being said kyle where would you put it on the list so far um, we have tinykin and hard space shipbreaker i would put it above hard space shipbreaker um but below tinykin i think i i think tinykin is is a little bit more innovative even though we talked about how not really innovative tinykin is um i think tinykin takes more from a bunch of different games and tmnt takes everything from the 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 90s version or the 80s version whatever it was and perfects it and tinykin is doing that with a bunch of different genres and and games and doing it all together and i think that's sort of more of a mastery if you want to call it that um i don't know i i would put it above hard space but below tinykin Okay, I I'll go next. I would put it below hard space. I just love hard space too much. Will, where would you put it? Uh, I would put it below hard space. Jake, I would also, but it's because a pref- personal preference in terms. Yeah, of that's fine. Hey, genre. You can tell Kyle fun. it's because you hate him. <laughs> it's no. fine. Yeah. <laughs> no. More like um, so ruthless. <laughs> all right, it's my turn. Let's talk about let's talk about Cult of the Lamb. Yay! Okay. Um, Cult of the Lamb is a rogue. Uh, fill in the blank. Will it is a rogue? Everything like it's a crossing like it's a rogue light. <laughs> it's light. light. Okay. Uh, Cult of the Lamb is a remake of Rogue. Um, it has very religious stylings. Uh, essentially, it's kind of a, a game split in two. Uh, on the one hand, you are delving into these dungeons. Uh, each run takes about 15 minutes. There's four of these dungeons. There's uh, three areas, and then there's a boss at the end. And in those dungeons, you are gathering materials, and you're gathering followers, and you're fighting a boss to progress the story. Um, but when you come out of the dungeon, it's kind of a little bit of like a animal crossing town simulator where essentially you have these followers and you are placing little buildings for them like you know tents for them to sleep and a little uh kitchen for them to cook at and a farm for them to farm from and they're they're semi self-reliant but you got to still go around and do some chores cult to the lamb i think what it does really really well is that it fully embraces its theme holy shit they made religion fun 
like it's <laughs> it's crazy there are so many mechanics in this game and what's crazy is that there's like <laughs> This is going to sound bad, but to me, I found it really exciting was that every mechanic like this. These are skill upgrades. These are passives. These are like, uh, you know, different types of mechanics that are in other games. But there's about a 10. There's like a five to 10 minute delay. Every time you're introduced to one of them, you're like, oh, this is, uh, you know, this is called uh, this is called a sermon. And you're like, OK, but what does this do? And you read into it and you go. Oh, a sermon is just like a once a day uh, a bonus action you get, you know, like like there's all these mechanics that are not that unique, but they have styled them so heavily that you're literally running this religion. And like I was trying to run a happy religion, but every now and then I'd be like, you know, what, you're an asshole. You have to, you have to kill someone. <laughs> we're going to we're going to call we're going to call the congregation and we're going to sacrifice your ass right now because I'm sick of you. OK, I'm sick of you or like when everybody's starving and you're like, look, I'm just going to brainwash you guys for three days so that you don't realize you're starving. OK, uh, and it's just like it's a lot of fun. Um, I think the other great thing about it is that it kind of has this self-controlled difficulty. Um, so I wasn't liking the combat too much since so I wasn't that great at it and I didn't really want to get good at it. And so I spent a lot of time in the town just maxing that out which gave me a lot of benefits going back into the dungeon. Like, like I, I hadn't even beat the first area and I was already like starting with like level nine weapons going into the dungeons. Um, so there's a lot of like self-controlled difficulty where you can spend time in one area or the other, depending on whether you like it or not. And that will benefit the other area that you may not enjoy as much. Um, problems I have with this game though, uh, the combat runs. I don't think the combat was very dynamic or unique. There's like three or four main weapon types, and I think one or two of them are just trash, and I always hated using them. Um, so the the combat starts to get a little stale by the time you get towards the end of the game. And number two, I never finished this game because I played this game at launch, and it had some very bad game-breaking bugs. Yeah. Um, we've talked about this before. There are only a handful of times that we have had to stop a stream early. Cult of the Lamb was one of them because I was trying to play it on an Xbox One X and it crashed multiple times in a row in this stream. Um, the other thing was, um, I don't know if they've ever fixed this, but when you're in a dungeon and you're killing people, you pick up faith or I forget what they call it. But there's this currency they're constantly dropping and you pick it up and fervor? that powers up your skills. Yeah, fervor. I don't I don't know how they ever went out the door with this, but that fervor just slowly the more you go through the run it's the more slowly it drops and the more slowly it gathers to you like it literally is lagging until it got to a point in most of my runs where five minutes in i couldn't pick up any fervor because the enemies would drop it and it would just sit there and it was just like really broken mm. there was a, a bug for a while where um when you go to church and you call a sermon or whatever all your followers are supposed to show up and there was only about five or six that would show up for me and so there were missions and quests that I just failed because they're like, you need to kill this person. And I'm like, they're not showing up to fucking church when I call them, you know, <laughs> and and they'd all just kind of built to this point where I was like 75 percent of the way through that game. And I just flat out could not finish it. I, I, I don't know. Did you guys kind of have that similar buggy experience? Did you, did all you guys play, play it at launch? Xbox? No, so I, I played on my PC. I had one. It was, I, I mean, technically it was game breaking because I couldn't progress, but literally the opening cinematic would cause my screen to go completely black um, and I could not progress. Uh, I spent about two hours looking through forums, trying out different solutions Jeez. until I found out that it was vSync was screwing it up <laughs> and, and you just needed to turn vSync off. Um, and uh, that was really annoying. But luckily, that was at the beginning before you actually get to like do much of anything. So it wasn't like I had started to enjoy it and then came to a halt. It was like I didn't even get to start. And then, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't feel that bad about it. But once that bug was done, um, I never had any other game breaking issues. I never had any glitches. Um, I really like this game, uh, I think. And we talked about this last week uh, on local chat, but I really like the speed and pacing at which it introduces new um, new concepts yep. and, and game mm -hmm. mechanics. I think it does it at a really it's just it's a really clipped pace like it's fast for a lot of other games, but it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming, which I think is a really hard balance to find. Um, so I was constantly excited that that new stuff was happening and that I was able to do stuff and um, not feel like I was getting bogged down with 
you know, overly complex mechanics and stuff like that. It's all, again, it's all kind of like surface level -y. Like it, it's, there's like passive stuff um, that happens. You can buff people. You can sacrifice your followers so that they follow you into the combat zones and give you little um, like extras when you're going through. I I didn't mind the combat, I think, as much as you did, Ian. I, I thought that it was fine for what it was. I wasn't like mm -hmm. enamored with it, but I had fun every time I did a combat run. And um, I was the same thing with you where I kind of maxed out my my weapon levels as, as much as I could early on. Um, and then I actually found out that like the combat was almost as equally fun as the, the farming stuff and, and just, just um, going through and like getting your followers to chop down wood and then going to get a refinery. And then you can, you know, there's like a card game sort of aspect to it. There's the fishing game, but they're all, they're all not super deep. It's, you know, it, it's just there for you to go. Let's do something different for five minutes. Let's do this for 10 minutes and yeah. then come back and restart. I liked that they had the ability for you to kind of flip between these different aspects um, and not get tired out by one other thing or the other. Um, also, way more uh, eating poop than I realized that there was going to be in this game. That was that was definitely something I was not expecting. Um, it, it's it's a it's a mechanic. Uh, you can make you can make a, a, a poop dinner, and it's and some some of your followers just really want to do that. So, uh, yeah, I I really like this game. Uh, so that's that's pretty much my my two cents. Uh, who's yeah. next? Will Jake? Did you guys did you guys play Cult of the Lamb? Yeah, I I rolled credits. I played on Switch. Oh, um, okay. And I had some towards the end as my town got more kind of full of people and full of stuff. I had a little bit of frame dropping, frame uh -huh. rate slow down. Switch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I switch in handheld. I I chalked it up to that. Um, but, um, no, I had a lot of fun. I thought combat was serviceable, but, but entertaining. I think the, the, the sort of, um, liturgical cult running aspects were the more fun stuff The you know, doing a sermon every day and, and figuring out, you know, who's going to do what I early on got, I picked one of the, I can't remember what they, the, what they call them, like like your religious edicts or whatever oh, where yeah. it was like they'll your followers will be bolstered in their faith mm. witnessing someone be sacrificed because i kind of just <laughs> yeah. assumed that yeah, was yeah, gonna yeah. be a thing that would benefit me later on <laughs> um and then i got a couple of ones that got to like old age who are like please sacrifice me and i'm like bada bing bada boom <laughs> free faith yeah um yeah the very first quest though when a little you know shark came up to me and was like dear leader please a quest make this guy eat some poop yeah. <laughs> yeah. hilarious like, yeah all right you got I gotcha. it yeah. um but yeah no i had a, i had a ton of fun with it i think yeah it, animal crossing meets ritual sacrifice also um, just just to go off of what you said with like your mm -hmm. followers coming up to up to you i really liked that it wasn't all like endless praise like you actually mm -hmm. had heretics come in um which i thought was a really unique yeah. mechanic because then it was like oh i didn't realize i would have to contend with like a, a wolf in the flock or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and then it ended up the first heretic that i got I, I sacrificed him like immediately so he didn't even really get a chance to do much hereticking anyway sorry Will, I, I think you were gonna go or jake well no my on on that note of of um you know, wolves and sheep's clothing coming into the flock. Um, I did have the the first time I had a heretic come into camp was part of a quest. A follower was like, hey, this guy wants to join, but he's a little heretical. Mm. Please let him in. And so I let him in and I couldn't kill him or I'd fail the quest. I had mm. to, you know, re-educate him or whatever. But I hadn't yet unlocked any of the stuff to do that. So I was very frantically like going around being like, oh, I have to research how to make stocks <laughs> or I have mm -hmm. to research yeah. the skill because yeah. I almost lost control. I think I, uh, I think I just failed the quest like intentionally and then killed mm -hmm. him because I was like, I, I knew I was like, I don't want to build like this kind of a cult or whatever. We're just going to kill people who don't believe us. So. No, I did end yeah. up. I, I was able to research the stocks in time to put That's him good. in shackles in the town square and <laughs> and publicly humiliate him until he <laughs> changed his ways. <laughs> Will, did you play this game? 
No, I did not play this game. Fucking even in the piece of shit. Wow. Wow. Okay, well, that's <sighs> great. That that brings us to the part where I get to nominate a spot on the list. I nominate Cult of the Lamb to be below Tinykin and above Hard Space Shipbreaker. I think the bugs for this, as amazing as this game is, the bugs take a good chunk of that amazement back versus Tinykin just being like solid perfection. Uh, Will, any objections to that being? I I don't care what you think. Uh, but yeah, I think ahead. it should be below TMNT Shredder's Revenge. Wow, Jake. Wow. Oh. Um, I mean, I would put it below Hard Space, but ab- above TMNT. Okay, Kyle, where would you put it? I I would agree with you, Ian. Below Tiny Can, above Hard Space. Okay, so just to keep this moving, since we had two votes, are we okay with putting it below Tiny Can, above Hard Space for now? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Will doesn't get a vote. <laughs> no, I voted. Mine no, counts. but you should Back oh, to I you. Shouldn't. No, of course I should get a vote. Wait, I voted <laughs> the same side as you. <laughs> Wait, what are you doing? Uh, back to me, you said? Yes. Um, I would like to nominate... God. Well, it's just got to get into it. I would like to nominate... Case of the Golden Idol. Folks, oh boy. it's very rare that a game comes along and makes you rethink um, your life. Games such as this include Doom 2, <laughs> System Shock 2, Fallout New Vegas. Inscription. 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 The Case of the Golden Idol is so fantastic and brilliant that Socrates couldn't even <laughs> shape up to it. Anyways, it's a point and click adventure game where you're uh, clicking on things in the environment. You're getting your little you're filling out your scrolls and stuff a la Obra Din. Uh, you're just trying to figure out what the hell is going on in the scene by collecting clues and then you got to put it all together. Um, I played the demo of this game uh, and after that first case in the demo I immediately bought the game because I was like this is something I'm going to play. Uh, I flew through it. There were one or two. Um, so you play these cases and you solve them case by case. The cases, for the most part, are pretty not. I wouldn't say easy is the word, but the amount of time you would spend in, say, Tinykin beating a level is the amount of time you spend beating a case. Like, it's not like you're sitting there racking your brain for hours. If you can't figure one part out, you move to the next part and you slowly put it together. Um, I think we had talked about I forget when, Ian, uh, but discussing that there's a few times in that game where stuff just really doesn't line up and it's very much you it's the time in like dark souls or elden ring when you're up against a boss you can't beat the boss so you leave for a while play something else come back and the the answer strikes you and you can beat the boss you can beat the level all that sort of stuff uh i think the case of the golden idol does that brilliantly um the story they tell just to get into get into spoilers here the case of the golden oh, yeah. idol oh yeah is a wild story it's it incredible absolutely wild it has um, no right to do that it has no reason to do that but it goes fucking places and it's amazing edward cloudsley is that his name i think edmund? so yeah Ed- kills his edmund yeah edmund kills his brother right i can't remember the details i played I through right six yes cases I did Anyways, the, the first two chapters, so the, I think the I gist the of the story well. is this very rich guy comes across this idol, um, and you throughout the cases you follow him learning how to use the idol. Uh, then he suddenly passes away. Uh, then you are figuring out there, there's these two secret societies, much Templars, assassins, the uh, ruby rings. Um, yeah, what's the uh, what's the national treasure one? That's, That's the temple. The, no, it's JK. it's the, the no, it's the. I can't think of them. They're like the Freemasons. The, the Freemasons. It's thank the Freemasons. Oh. So yeah. it's a yeah. lot of that. Um, so there's two opposing sides. They do like dark magic. It's very um Sherlock Holmes, uh yeah. Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes, uh sort of setting. No. And so there's this cult aspects and everything. Slow and motion. then, as you yeah, not slow motion, but like cult, uh, believing in uh, yeah. mysticism and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so you get to the point finally that at the end 
which I didn't know until the end when they reveal it to you, but you could have figured it out along the way yeah. is that Edmund Cloudsley de-aged himself and may and broke into the other like Templar place that was against him and threw them down from within the inside and then made their leaders commit suicide through like these tests and like became their fake messiah and like took over the country yeah that's that's <laughs> i like i understand why you're so fascinated with the main guy like killing himself and i'm uh, not killing himself but like faking his death and then he yeah. ages but for me the big thing was like this is just like weird little murder mysteries and then it slowly builds to this point where you're like there's a time jump and you're just like wait a minute they took over all of britain and imposed like a completely separate weird fascist side of government and and like the story like Wild. and the first couple cases you could just be like oh it's set in you know 1700s early 1800s england cool that's i guess that's just the period and then it slowly just goes off into the rails into like fantasy like alternate history territory and it's like this is awesome and then the final case the final case where they're just like look you've been doing all these cases but the final case is like this giant map and there's all these different locations but then it also unlocks at the top of the screen it's like look to solve the final case you need to revisit some of the previous cases yeah. to get information from those like like there's a clue in the final case and it, it's somebody being like remember when we met at this location in 1722 and you're like oh yeah that's right and you go back to that case Case. like it's this game is is just absolutely incredible like this is the best point and click game i've ever played and i don't even like point and click games this is the game that oberdin wishes it was because i think oberdin's overrated like this is the type of game where they present you with a mystery, a puzzle. The puzzles get crazier and crazier. You feel so smart when you solve them because they give you everything you need to solve these cases. They don't and they don't even feel like obscenely difficult. It's just that you have to embrace it and actually do them. You can't you can't really brute force your way through them. Oh, um, you can't like this. You it's can. very it's very easy to <laughs> if you want to, but then you're not yeah. really playing the game um, like this game. This game is incredible. Like literally the only minor quibble I have with this game is that we, we were talking about this in the chat. I do think mission number two with the dinner party is a bit of a difficulty spike where it kind of opens up a bit and all of a sudden deluges you with a lot of stuff. But once you get past that, the rest of the game is amazing. So now that we know that this is number one on the list, let's hear from the naysayers. <laughs> I did not like this game. <laughs> Nor why, did I. Why not though? Why not? Um, I did not enjoy the game. I just didn't have no, fun no, with it. No, no, no. This game of the year. <laughs> give, give me actual criticism. We're gonna discuss here. This isn't me defending um, the game. This is me saying we have to put on a good discussion here. Uh, okay. Well, it's not gonna be game of the year because you've already got two detractors. So, um, I don't think that it is. I, I don't think it's necessarily as as wildly good as you guys claim it is. And I think it's because I just fundamentally don't enjoy this type of gameplay. I don't like point and click as much as maybe you guys do. Um, I also just struggled a lot with, uh, like Jake was saying in the chat, like the logic of some of the puzzles just didn't really track with me. And you guys talking about like I, I beat the first two chapters me i think me and jake did the exact same stuff and you guys talking about the expansive nature of the end game makes me happy that i stopped playing because i just did not want to experience any more of what it had to offer um i didn't feel smart solving some of the ones that i didn't brute force i felt stupid for not getting them sooner and for for not understanding the sort of weird circuitous non-circuitous logic that it has to some of the the evidence that it presents you with um and i just didn't care for the story at all like i i hearing you guys talk about it makes me makes me realize i think maybe my brain was thinking that it was going to start to go off the rails like it did and i was like i'm just not here for that so i didn't i didn't beat it i didn't care for it i'm not going to play it okay that's fair jake yeah, I, I was like the the first. There's the first case that's on the the cliff. That's basically just the tutorial. Like, mm. you know, here's how this is gonna be. I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm picking up what this game's putting down. Um, and then even by like the third case, I was just feeling really dumb. Like, I was not. 
I was trying like it. You, it has a hint button, but it's always like, please don't play with hints. I, so I never use. I never use the hints because it said it would make you do a task, and I was like, I, well, I don't want to do more work, so I'm, I'm not going to use the hints. It's like you know, like a captcha almost, oh, like okay. dragging right. and dropping words to <laughs> faces. Uh, oh, okay. But um, yeah, there were just a couple of times where it was. A couple of times it was just me being stupid and and then it would click and I'd be like, oh, sure, that's why. But I'd always get down to I would solve almost everything. And it was always the left hand scroll. That's that's what I where it was filling yeah. things in. And I would be like certain I knew who the killer was and how they had done it. And it would be like two or fewer of these are incorrect. And I would just start moving stuff around. Feeling like dumb and bad about myself and then eventually i'd solve it and i'm like okay sure and then i got to the dinner party like every every other time that this happened when i got to the final solution i was like okay i got it i'm tracking with it i i now see the logic trail sure i still feel like an idiot then i got to the dinner party and i i brute forced that one just because I, I I knew everything except who had asked the woman to poison the drink. Oh. Um, and I was just throwing words up there randomly until it was like, oh, now you solved it. Because um, it was like there was a letter in Edmund Cloudsley's or there's several, several letters in the trash, two of which are vaguely threatening. Mm. One is from a guy I think named like George Blythe or something. No. Soros. Duh, duh, sorry, I was thinking Gilbert Blatt. That's Anne of Green Gables. It's George something. <laughs> and then one that's like an ominous, like, hey, buddy, you're going to die. And it's from like Final Vanguard or something. And so like, oh, that must be the secret society that ordered this woman because she's got a coded letter where uh-huh. you have to read the words in a certain order. Um, and yeah. it seemed like it lined up, but then it was, but then it ended up the secret society was like pulling words from her note and from like a, like a pulp novel somewhere else in the mansion. And that just really didn't, I still don't fully understand. Didn't they, wasn't they borrowing it from the lady? So it was that lady's book in the first place and somebody borrowed it from her. Yeah, maybe, but it was that one. If they were really stupid, that's also partially what I struggled with was just the the dinner, even just like, I don't know that that whole thing. I I, at that point, I had checked out and I was like, I'm just finishing this so I can say I I got as far as Jake did. But yeah, it, it I feel like some certain things to certain types of players of this game are not well communicated enough. And the the lines between the connect the, the connectivity between the evidence and the stuff you find is not as clean as it as it might appear to other players who are so I, who so, are like primed to to play this game. So I would push back on that because I hearing you guys describe this, there's two things that are sticking out to me. Number one, you said you could brute force the puzzles. I don't think that's true because in all those instances, you came down to one or two pieces of information that you weren't sure of. And so you had solved most of the puzzle and you were able to, quote unquote, brute force the final. And I don't think that really counts as brute forcing the puzzle. Oh, sh- um, I, sure. I guess you couldn't do all the scrolls in that way. You but, have to get it to a certain yes. point. And, uh, I, and I think the I think the other thing is that I'm thinking about Pentiment, which we'll talk about in a bit. But Pentiment is like, hey, you have to solve this. And it's like, well, it turns out there is not a single perfect solution that you can get to this. And even though in case of the Golden Idol, there is a correct solution, et cetera, there is more than enough there presented that you don't have to understand all those connections. I certainly didn't in most of the cases, but you could understand enough to put enough on the board to then make educated guesses at the rest of it. And. I think that's what makes Case of the Golden Idol so great is that it's not like there is one solution and you must understand all of it and it's impossible for you to understand it unless you're a genius. It is constantly walking you through it and saying, hey, now you got to make some you got to make some logic leaps here. And so I understand your frustration, but I think part of that is you're approaching it like a normal puzzle game where it's like there is one solution. You have to fully understand it in order to get there. And that's not quite 
what well, this what this game does. The, the fact that you don't have to understand it doesn't take away from the fact that there is still one solution. You do have to place things in the proper places in order to progress. And I think that for some players, it just doesn't click as well as it does for other players. And I don't think that's a failing of the game necessarily. I mean, it they, they was clearly designed with a very specific uh, methodology in mind, but I think it's just a difference in approach uh, for for certain players and me and Jake just approached it differently and it didn't it didn't click and for you guys it did. But but so let me let me bring a point there. You know, going back to TMNT Shredder's Revenge, that that game's not for me. Mm. But I don't think that makes the game bad. But it sounds like you are saying Case of the Golden Idol is bad because it didn't click for you, just based on your attitude towards it. I mean, we're ranking games based on subjectivity, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm I think I would I would want to make a very specific point that. It just it made me feel dumb. And I know that's like not a, a yeah. great like taxonomy or a qualifier or something that you can really like. Like grapple but Jake, with. But Jake, but, let me ask you something. Did it make you feel smart when you solved the case? No. Did you have a yeah. sense of accomplishment? It, I did no. not have yes. a sense of accomplishment. I, I, I think that's really the didn't. big difference here. <laughs> I really I, didn't. I agree. I, yeah. That game made me feel dumb in a lot of places. When I solved it, then I was like, you go back and you're like, oh, yeah, it was this yes. because of XYZ. It was this because of that. I got so, it. So, like, I, I 100% it. agree with you. I also agree with Ian saying the brute force thing. You guys got close enough. Like, there were a few of those cases. Well, then I had to I, do the flip flop to get there, and then I'm like, "Oh, okay, now it clicks for me." But I, I think say, it boils down to you just you two don't enjoy that type of game, and we two do enjoy that. Type I did not yeah, receive and, any catharsis yeah, from right, the yeah. solution. Yeah, and I don't think that's necessarily something you can argue with. Like it's just how we feel. Well, yeah, like I feel because no, I fair. I really like the art style. I really like the music. Yeah, I, I, I like the, the atmosphere. But yeah. it just made me feel dumb and I, I would get to the solution and I would not feel any fulfillment from it. I would just feel more stupid. <laughs> OK, yeah. so let's let's I, I think we've discussed this a lot. We're probably going to come back to it as we start to massage the list. I'm going to nominate a spot based on what's here so far. I think it's top of the list. Um, let's go around the horn. Will, where would you put it on the list? Um, <clears throat> I think it's also top of the list. And I'd put it at the bottom. <laughs> I would also put it at the bottom. OK, for the sake of moving on, I'm going to put it right in the middle below Cult of the Lamb, Heart Space Ship Breaker. And sure. at the end, we will yeah. be coming back to this. Because <laughs> yes. I, I think just to bring up the point now, which is me for a lot of these games, like I didn't play Cult of the Lamb. I listened to what you guys said. I gave my best judgment on that. But also with Case of the Golden Idol, like. I think it did something so crazy and unique in a year of games that well, you got a God yeah. of War Ragnarok. You got an Elden Ring, which I know Elden Ring. We'll talk about it later, but it's another Souls game. You've got a bunch of these games that are the same, and it did a unique thing like other games that are still in the nominees. So, like thinking about it that way, I like putting aside that it may have made you feel dumb. Like I think stuff deserves that sort of thing when you're uh, you talking like about the narrative makes that. me want to continue it because it sounds like something that's yes. exactly up my alley. Um, yeah, it just gets better and better. It really does. But the gameplay just. <laughs> but uh, again, anyways, I just anyways, like me feel stupid. If it was yeah. a book, yeah. I would read it. That's that's what I would. That's what I would say. Right, I would take this in a different format. Jake, pick a nominee. Is it let's back to me? Uh, yes. The I'll let's let's talk about Signalis. Oh, boy. Let's do it. OK, let's do it. So. The kind of the through line of all the games that I nominated specifically and all the games that have broadly been my previous games of the years are games that I have like an emotional response to. Um, I think because I more come from a background of like filmmaking, writing, kind of storytelling type things, I will I will grip onto games that have like something really meaty that i can sink my teeth into um even if it's very kind of opaque and out there like and, and open to interpretation like signalis is i have no experience with the games that signalis is riffing on i've you know i watch videos about it people are mentioning silent hill 2 they're mentioning resident evil Whoosh. I have no kind of attachment to that genre. I have no nostalgia for those games, but I went into this because 
uh, like with hard space it has a very grimy sci-fi aesthetic that i'm like mm, yes me here in my wayland yutani branded sweater um and i went into it and i was just so compelled by it within like the first half hour it was just so weird and so um like everything was so evocative the cutscenes and the environments and the the characters i thought the gameplay was great for not having any experience with the kind of game that this was um i know i a lot of people and i'm sure some of us on this will complain about the inventory system um i didn't mind that because i just liked kind of wandering around that world even if i had to go back to some room to go get something um the music was great the on the art direction I loved it. <laughs> let's let's go around the horn. Will, did you play Signalis? Yeah, I I, I made a decent chunk into it. Um, I cannot think of where I left off. I left off uh, on the, when it was like floors six, seven, eight, like that sort of thing. After you fell down the elevator shaft, mm-hmm. you know, after you got pushed it. down the elevator shaft, yeah, yeah. and uh, and landed on the top of bodies of you. Mm-hmm. um which was fantastic um i i really enjoyed w- what i played of it um I, again i'm there with you on the style side I, I like resident evil games i've never played silent hill but um so that sort of top down thing and then it also had th- uh first person portions which were very oh, like yeah. early ps1 so uh, good 3d stuff which was great uh the st- the what i was starting to get hinting of the story was was fun and interesting um you mentioned the inventory management that pissed me off to no end because it's the worst part of resident <laughs> yeah. evil and it's just in this game um i i agree with you i don't mind going back for an item and stuff like that but i thought the enemies were so stupid and fucking annoying all the time that i stopped playing that game because it was just i didn't want to deal with the stress of going through an area with them in it again because it put me off so much um you can knock them down and like do fight stuff with them but then at one point they all started getting back up again and i was just like the safety of me getting rid of wasting all of my ammo and getting rid of them was now gone and i was just like no i I don't want to do this um so on that side uh, that's kind of why i stopped playing it but all the like weird stuff that was going on was very much my vibe um but the gameplay just kind of let me down at that point. Uh, Ian or Kyle, did you, either of you play it? Played a couple hours. Um, I also watched Jake's video, which is very good. You should watch it if you hadn't. Um, Thanks. I did not obviously finish the game, but I watched and read um, through like what happens in the story um, and watched some watch some other gameplay. I just kind of ran out of time, but I, I did want to literally like see it through. Um, to, to the end at least watching it um i think jake's jake's video is spot on with a lot of your analysis and the 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 incredibly like dense emotions that are sort of underneath everything that mimic it's sort of like dante's inferno almost i mean there's like a weird sort of just going down further deeper um the the psychology of the game i think is really beautifully sort of painted on the wall sometimes and um i i really liked what i played it's not necessarily my type of game um but for for it to make that much of a an atmospheric and an emotional impact on me that that i was compelled to finish it through by other means other than playing it um i think was pretty powerful and um i don't know i i really enjoyed the world that it created and the story that it told uh, for for what it was yeah, I, I don't have much to say on it because similar to you, Kyle, I, I didn't play much of it. This ain't my type of game, but I really respect the the quality of the product they have made here. Um, you know, they very easily could have just made a survival horror game. They very easily could have just made a retro style game, but they didn't. They really are embracing the genre, the story beats along with that, the weird themes, presenting a lot of that throughout. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad you guys really enjoyed it. It's not a game for me, though. Um, but it, I, I genuinely do like that people are really enjoying what they're putting down in this game. Uh, Jake, where would you put it on the list? 
me personally, it would be at the top of the list. I also I want to make just just one mention of the there's a fake out ending, um, <laughs> yeah. which is different on desktop than it is on console mm, like on the xbox it's got like quick resume and whatnot so when i got the fake out ending i you know i went to bed but when i got back it just went to the same menu but we got a comment on my signalis video that somebody was saying that on pc when you get to the fake out ending it, it rolls through the credits it throws you back to the menu if you hit quit it puts you back in the game mm, it doesn't wow. quit it's a it's a fake menu wow um, are you are you gonna play it on pc like are you gonna redo it on pc just to get that i'm gonna redo it at some point i don't know i don't know when but it's (laughs) i i just yeah i mean i've already played it twice because i played it once and then i played it through entirely again to get b-roll for um the video um but um yeah for me it would be at the top of our current list um but i i know like with hard space this was one where i'm like hmm it's, a it's for, for me, me. <laughs> it's just for me kyle where would you put it on the list um below cult of the lamb for me okay i think i would put it again because of the bugs i would put it above cult of the lamb uh will where would you put it i would put it below case of the golden idol okay so i think hmm. i think maybe i think it's I think Below it's Cult of the Lamb. I think it's you and yeah, you I think and me. So. I think that's yeah. splitting it. Yeah. Okay. Which is uh, wrong. We can all agree. <laughs> Jake's happy. Uh, we finally made Jake happy. I can now watch that video. It's, since, uh, did you not watch my video? No, because I didn't want to get oh, spoiled. I wanted you to spoil it for me. It is pretty. We're going to say spoilers heavy. here. Yeah. Um, it is pretty spoiler heavy. Yeah. But it's like. I did. There's so, there's so much that I didn't even touch in my video. <laughs> that's that's what good, I wanted good, to say. We gotta keep. Yeah. We gotta no, keep we, going. We, we, I we know. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kyle, you want to pick a game? Yeah, I'll I'll throw it up here. Um, let's do Stray, just because. Again, I mean, I know some people don't think that it should be on this list. Um, I said this when I beat it four hours or five hours after it came out. Um, I really like this game. It's not incredible. But you play as a cat. I like cats. I thought it created a really interesting, unique world with a very, very cool atmosphere that I really dug. Um, I thought the story that it told for what it was and how it was presented was was tight and 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 well put together. Um, I also I don't know if we we talked about this necessarily, but the ending actually maybe it's because humans are really prone to care about animals that they you know, they care about. Um, I was like emotionally very, very touched by the ending of the game. It's, it's not like a, I'm an easy cry. And I, but I was like, Oh, okay. Like this is what they're doing. I thought it was really sweet. Again, there's a lot of games on this list that we can say this about, but it's not breaking new ground, but what it does, I think it does really well. It's just like a sweet little lovely game that has a little bit of a dark side. It's kind of gritty and dirty. Um, but it's cool. I mean, I, I just I really enjoyed what, for what it was um, and the, the small team that made it. Um, I think they they set out to do something really cool and they did it and it was received really well. And I'm really happy for them. Um, but it's it's not a groundbreaking game by any means, but it was good. I, I had a good time with it. Um, yeah, I'm going to throw some oil on the fire. I I disagree with you, Kyle, mm-hmm. because you said it's great. It's doing a lot of things really well. And I don't I don't think so. I feel like this is just a solid ass seven with a nice coat of paint on it. Um, so yeah, I'm at like an eight point five. That's where I okay. was with that. And I think so for me, I straight think- for me, Stray feels like 2022's Untitled Goose Game, where it's like, yeah, this is a cool game. It's OK to play. But it's one of those things where because they did one thing slightly different and unique, it becomes very well loved in a superficial and exterior to the gaming community type of way. You know, um, they do a fantastic job of portraying a cat, but then the world is cool, but not great. The quest cool, but not great. The the movement, the puzzles, the platforming, the the side quest, they're cool, but not great. Like this just feels like a solid seven across the board. And the only thing it has going for it is that it does a cat really well. Yeah, I mean, I I. 
it's sort of like what I said, like it's not it's not groundbreaking, but I also didn't get the sense that the, the developers were hoping to be groundbreaking in multiple different ways. And not that that's something that you can necessarily quantify, but like, I don't know, I, I, I got the opposite where I felt like the 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 type of gameplay that they had fit with the character that you were playing. Um, I thought the world was expansive enough for the length of the game. It wasn't too much. It wasn't too little. It was solid. Um, I thought the pacing was really good. The pacing of the story and and the certain things that you get to do. I don't know. I I liked it. I had a different reaction than you did, but I want to hear what uh, Jake and Will have to say yeah. about it. Yeah, Let's... I um I enjoyed Stray. Sorry, Jake. Um, no, 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 I enjoyed yeah. Stray. Um. I didn't finish it. I, I played it one session and then never felt the urge to go back to it. Um, I honestly, the most fun I had with that game is when I modded it on PC and put all the different weird <laughs> cats into it, uh, which was super fun. I put it, I made it into a pug and that was pretty fun. But um, overall, like I, I think it's a solid seven as well. Maybe a little bit higher than that. I like the coat of paint on it. I like the cat movement. I wanted more from it uh, as someone who had followed it for a while. Um, I think if it had been announced farther from release, it would be a different game. I I agree with Ian and to some extent to to the community and the fervor around it is much bigger than the actual game is. Same with Untitled Goose Game. Like it just became separate entities where it was like this is a cat game there's a cat in it and like it was on the news and there were cat experts talking about it and all this sort of stuff where it's just like it was the same it, with the goose it, game where it's, they're like it's sort of gimmicky yeah yeah totally yeah. And, and it took off on a mind of its own because they didn't talk about it for a while it released and then it was just like cat game same with the untitled goose and like other stuff like that so that is a different track of its own um I think the game's fun. It's got cool stuff in it. The environments are nice. It's pretty to look at, but I just never felt the like connection with it to keep playing it. Um, and just, it just wasn't for me. Jake, did you get a chance to play stray? I will say regrettably, this was one I was not able to do my homework on. Um, in, in part, I should have played this <laughs> this week um instead of gran turismo i will say unfortunately i did not vibe with gran turismo um but um i i've i've watched a fair amount of people play this game and yeah i i, I guess i without having then personally played it myself i would agree with as many of the sentiments that have been voiced as i can um obviously without able to say whether or not i would be able to form an emotional connection with it myself um but um yeah. Okay. So in the interest of moving on, Kyle, where would you put it on the list? Um, I honestly, and this may surprise you, I'd put it at the bottom of the list. Like I know fundamentally it is not better than any of the games that we have listed, but I still think it deserves to be on the list. So okay. that's that's where I'd put it. Okay. Yeah, I think I would put it at the bottom as well. Will, where would yeah. you put it? I totally agree. I was gonna put it above TMNT. But that is a game that you played and you're putting it below. So I would yeah. I, I agree with you. I think it belongs in the top 10. Sure. I was just being I think we're all being harsh on all these games because we want to fill out the list. We don't want to all be <laughs> yeah. like, it's number one. It's number one. It's number yeah. 10. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to be realistic about it. So, yeah. And we got we got plenty of time to fight later. Yeah. Speaking of fighting, it's my turn. Let's talk about Elden Ring. Um, oh, boy. Elden Ring. I, so my personal experience with Elden Ring this year is dealing with a bias I have had against Soulsborne games. Um, I have a little bit of experience with Soulsborne games. I probably played five or six hours at Dark Souls 1. I appreciated it, did not enjoy it. I've played every other Soulsborne game except for uh, Sekiro for a series we did. Um, and by played, I mean I played literally the first hour. And that was it. Uh, <laughs> so my Classic. personal challenge this year has been to kind of scrutinize myself and my bias against Soulsborne games and kind of say, is this a valid bias and why do I have it? And, and I think part of it is like th there is absolutely a toxic fan base about Soulsborne games. They use it as kind of a, a dick measuring browbeaten contest where they're just like, I beat this game. That means I am better than you. If you can't beat this game, you're not a good gamer. And they don't treat games as art. They don't treat games as entertainment. They treat them as tests of skill as feats to be mastered. And I don't really like that mentality of gaming. 
Um, and I, I don't I don't attribute that to these games. It's just the toxic fan base around these games. Um, it could also be that this game, honestly, uh, you know, just to counter what I just said, the Soulsborne games, they are built around the get good game design. They don't they don't take things easy. They don't give you an easy way out. Nine times out of ten, you have to go through that boss. Um, and I think part of the bias against Elden Ring is, uh, Kyle, you put it really well a couple months ago, which is that it's not that I don't want Elden Ring to be game of the year. It's that I hate that it's expected to win game of the year, especially now that we're on the other side of the game of the year cycle and it's it's gotten an obscene number. Um, I I recognize what makes these games great. And Elden Ring, it, it has done the best job at presenting that enjoyment of the Soulsborne games to a wider audience by basically taking away a lot of that get good at mentality and letting you kind of do what you need to do to get to a point where you feel comfortable to get through that next story beat or that next big boss. Um, and I definitely enjoyed this more than the other ones. I played this the longest. I played about 30 hours. I got almost all the way through the Academy before I, you know, finally tired out and put it down. But um, when it comes down to this, like this game, this is the seventh game. I don't I don't buy the bullshit of people saying Elden Ring is different. This is a different game. It's not. This is the seventh game that they have made in this almost exactly the same style. They have made some positive changes. You know, I think the open world decision has made it just a much better series overall. Um, but this game has the same exact problems that the other games suffer from. It has the same exact user experience issues. The menus are trash. How you interact with the menus, how you interact with items is trash. It has this whole idea of like obscurity punishment where like they're not really going to tell you how things work. They're really not going to tell you what this item does. They're going to mask it behind a lot of lore stuff, which means you end up having your phone next to you and you're just having to constantly Google shit about this game because it doesn't explain itself. And even just exploring the world, a lot of times you go through some difficult boss and you get an item and you realize this item is fucking useless for my build. And it feels like punishing because of the the scale and obscurity of these items. And this at the end of the day, this is 95% of the same game. They've made some great strides here, but when it comes to 2020, 20, 2022, I'm looking for games that are new and innovative, doing something really well, really exciting, hopefully pushing genres forward. And I don't think Elden Ring really does that. Um, so that's my spiel. Who wants to who wants to take over? Uh, I I can go next. Um, I think Elden Ring is an incredible achievement of uh, from software. I the the as someone who is currently playing Dark Souls Remastered, I can't tell you how much I would like to be just playing Elden Ring. Uh, as <laughs> yeah. someone who has recently beat it and has a hundred hours in it, Dark Souls Rem like I. I'm just like, oh, I have to fight this boss. I can't can't do anything else. I can't I can't go farm people because it's going to take forever. I just have to buckle up and do this boss. And I think that's the thing I liked about Elden Ring the most is I'm not great at Elden Ring. I'm great at at brute, not brute forcing, but I'm great at like finding the weird path through Elden Ring that. I, the next person I fought was just a little bit harder and a little bit nice. harder. So I made my way through Elden Ring and I was able to use the spirit ashes, which are an incredible addition to this game. I was able to use call people in the same old way. I agree with you. Souls UI design is not from software's uh, yeah. cup of tea. They have they it's like they took everything from Armored Core, a game franchise I haven't played, but like they took all the robot you know, atta attachment points and they were just like, what if humans were like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And they just made the menus like that. The co-op and multiplayer system is hot garbage. I think we've yep. said that. Um, I think it works for Elden Ring, but it is presented wrong. It is presented as like it, it's it's presented because so many people complain that they want to play with their friends in Soulsborne games. Just, just real quick. If you told me the multiplayer was designed by Nintendo, I would believe you. Because right. that's how bad it is. And I could tell they only put that stuff in there because people would complain without it. And they kept it bullshit and stupid because they're like, don't play with your friends. It's meant for you to make these sort of not emotional connections. But like I beat the final boss today and I called a random person, two random people. The first guy died within the first two minutes. The second guy and I 
Oh, I thought, he was completely I thought you met on the phone. You you had no, them come in with. You. I had okay. to come into the boss fight. The second, yeah, I wish he died on the phone. Um, <laughs> the second guy was completely naked, uh, and we had a blast. They were they weren't. This is a great Soulsborne experience. They weren't beating the boss for me. They were showing me what to do to fight the boss, and that's something that's very cool in the Soulsborne community. Um, back when I used to play Dark Souls one and two and three, like. The people would message you on Xbox, be like, hey, great job with that. This is what you do for next time, because they're just assuming you're going to hit the new game plus. Um, overall, the journey of Elden Ring for me was incredible. It's the second Soulsborne game I've ever beaten. Bloodborne was the first. I think to your point about the get good mentality, I hate that. That is the reason mm -hmm. I didn't play Dark Souls for so long. I think it's a stupid mentality. It's still around today. You can see the video of that girl beating Elden Ring with a gamepad and a dance pad, people are still like, oh, she's cheating. And it's just like, dude, get over it. But I think what Bloodborne did for the Soulsborne games is what Elden Ring has done to a greater extent, where people yeah. I would never imagine playing a Soulsborne game, uh, two of them in this room. Kyle, I can imagine you playing a Soulsborne game. Uh, <laughs> And I have one has beaten it and the other you put 30 hours into it and I'm sorry that's a, that's a lot that's more a than lot I thought I ever would yes. for an Ian Gibson um, I just think I, and I agree with you it, for me this year it was if Ragnarok won everything I'd be like because I played four or five hours of that and it feels like more of the same Elden Ring to me felt very different although stuck in some of their ruts at From Software I think they've done an incredible job at creating a wholly new product that to a lot of people gave them a second chance on Soulsborne games. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think I'd like to see the rest of my time. Jake, what do you think? Um, yeah, so I, the, it's interesting. I will talk first about, like has been mentioned twice here, the get good mentality to slightly spoil next month's spotlight video. Part of what I talk about is my, it's going to be a video about other than ring and it's part of it, talking about my experience with the Soulsborne games and i had not played any of the Soulsborne games specifically because everything i ever heard about them was like they're so tough they're so difficult and i've never considered myself to be a great gamer in any sort of capacity like i was always i'm my my kd ratio is super low any sort of multiplayer game I get into, Halo, Call of Duty, whatever, I would always play those with friends just, you know, because you're playing video games with friends, not because I necessarily loved playing any sort of like, you know, tense kind of competitive games. Um, and it wasn't until Bloodborne that I knew the Soulsborne games had like environment traversal and non-boss enemies because I only ever heard people talk about the bosses. And I always heard, you know, it's so tough, this boss, that boss, whatever. And I never knew that there was like another component to any of these games. Um, so I, I wasn't even going to play Elden Ring until it was added to our list of, you know, games that you should play so that we can have this discussion. I had totally still in my brain written off I'm not good enough to play a from software game. Why would I, you know, waste my time with that? Fast forward, I've rolled credits on Elden Ring um <laughs> in in 101 hours. Um so I know on the local chat, the ironic thing of that is on local chat you had asked me about it right after I at nine hours had beat Margit and you had said, Will you continue it? And I had voiced some concerns about, you know, like you had said, the opacity of of kind of just knowing what all the systems do and like you said some items you have to like like they're really relying on you going into the secondary menu to read the extended description of the thing so that you'll be like oh this gives me you know more hp that gives me such and such that boosts my faith this does that this item can be used at some location i haven't reached yet um it's weird now that i'm 100 hours into it and I, I do most, I feel like I have a grasp of the systems. I don't know if it's, you know, Dunning-Kruger, is that what they call it? Where you think you know, and then you don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm experiencing any of that, where I'm like, oh yeah, I get it now. But even at this point, I just started New Game Plus so that I can capture some clean B-roll. Um, and even at that, 
towards the end of the game, I was still kind of figuring stuff out and discovering new things and being like, oh, that works well with this, this works well with that. For me, it is a standout achievement in art design um, and just kind of like we talked about with Shipbreaker, just kind of like broad strokes, world building, the kind of that it's just this really weird, grimy fantasy world. Nothing in this world is normal. There are no normal people or normal <laughs> things. Everything's got to be like funky and messed up. Except for, um, except for the turtle game. That's a real except thing. for the turtles. There's just there's tortoises that are totally <laughs> the dogs, normal. Please, the like, dogs. Sorry, sorry, they're dogs. Sorry. Yeah, I do yeah. love the 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 meme culture of the player messages. Yeah. Um, <laughs> try try finger butthole. Um, yes, and but there is one enormous oh, turtle just... wearing a little bishop. Yeah, hat it's the it's the pope. It's the turtle pope <laughs> who you can he's give great. prayer books to, and he's like, ah, this is heresy but there's still some cool stuff we could learn from it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I will say the, the, the broad strokes get good community mindset is the reason I think I beat every boss except Margit. I just didn't even try because I didn't want to, um, or not, not Margit. Sorry. Melania. Melania down mm. at the bottom of the hallig tree the hallig tree because yeah. i know that was the one where right after that was the you know the whole let me solo her whatever <laughs> and everybody kind of very early was like this is the toughest from soul from software boss ever and so even playing 100 hours in elden ring and feeling like i got a grasp of it i didn't want to touch that because i didn't want to punish myself maybe i can beat her maybe i it's a mental maybe it's my own mental block but um yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. I do think knowing what I know, having watched people play the other ones, I do think, Ian, like you said, it's not necessarily doing much iteratively um, besides adding the open world and I guess things like the Spirit Ashes, which I was super jazzed about having that kind of thing to distract a boss so that I can mm -hmm. stab them in their butt a bunch. Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. More so than I thought I would, especially after that first local chat where I was like, yeah, whatever. And then the very next day, I was <laughs> back plugging at away again. at it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Sorry, I rambled about that for a while. Uh, what about you? Um, I've said my piece on this game a lot. Uh, I will say it again. I have not felt as enraptured by a gameplay experience as I had playing Elden Ring since probably breath of the wild and breath of the wild has a caveat because i was uh two days out of major icu surgery when i played that game and had literally nothing else to do <laughs> um so elden ring came i think at the 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 perfect point in time for me to to tackle it and the fact that i felt like i could tackle it i proceeded to tackle it multiple times failing a lot and and winning a lot and and asking my friends for help and and diving into the lore, uh, not really understanding why certain things were the way they were, and then sort of just accepting it and going with it. I think, I think Elden Ring is one of the best, it's probably the best presented Souls game, just, just insofar as what it sets you off with and how the world around you expands, um, not just with your knowledge, but literally the map. Um, I think that feeling of expansiveness and this sort of this sort of growing sense of I get to do all of this stuff if I want to. And and you don't have to. You don't have to do everything. You can just make a beeline for the major bosses and go and do that if that's what you really want to. But for me, playing it felt like like unwrapping like a piece of origami basically where it was like mm -hmm. it's this it's this beautiful little thing you look at it and you're like okay cool and then you you see how one thing connects to another and how it's folded over and it functions and then you just keep doing that until you see it all laid out in front of you and you're like wow this is really complex but at the same time i think i fully understand how all of it works and the fact that i can still have fun while having that sort of baseline understanding of everything, I think is a testament to its game design, to its art direction. The music I think is 
really oh, really yeah. good mm-hmm. it adds it adds so much atmosphere to the different scenes that you find yourself in um Kaled is still scary and I've beaten every <laughs> boss in that in that map and I still don't want to go back there um I think I also the am coming at it it's off the vibe yeah the vibes are not great Ohio. Um, it, yeah definitely um Cleveland uh so <laughs> will you actually said you, you could see me playing a souls game it's the first souls game I've ever played I I accidentally played 15 minutes of the original Dark Souls without knowing what it was um, and immediately turned it off when I died at the first boss and thought, oh, this is just a janky game. Like, this is just... This is just a, it is a janky game. Oh, that was <laughs> correct. And that was that was that was my response. And I it was almost like I had like a like a little pocket in my mind where I was like, I'm just gonna forget that this thing exists. And I I came at Elden Ring being like, okay, I've never played one of these games before. My my one friend who I, I did a lot of co-op with the game, he helped me um with some of the some of the navigation stuff until I could do it on my own. Um having someone to guide you is is actually a really nice thing to have and and someone who's way more experienced in that not just the lore but how how the game functions and they can explain it to you is great obviously not everyone is going to have that but that was my experience going into it and i i do want to say because we've all we've all mentioned it we've all talked about the um the get good community i felt really far removed from that community because i was surrounded by friends who were really supportive and i didn't feel like it was necessary to like engage with that side of it um and I, I think that that's sort of the mentality that Elden Ring invites is is a more positive one, um, more so than a lot of the other Dark Souls games. And to Will, and I, th- I think Ian or Jake both said it, I'm seeing people play this who I never see play video games. My my old one of my old kind of bosses from my old job was like he played Spider-Man and then he jumped into Elden Ring. And I was like, that's a really big leap. And he was like, <laughs> I he was like, I like it. And and the fact he, I mean, he's you know, late 40s, early 50s, not the typical gamer who's gonna play this game, but he enjoyed it. And I think that I think that really says something about the quality of the game overall. And and for all its unapproachability, the approachability of Elden Ring and and how I don't know. It, some something about it just really spoke to me in a way that I I haven't had an experience like that in a long time, and it was just really nice to to lose myself in that world for 150 hours or whatever it was. Um, yeah, that's that's my piece. Um, All right, I have one, I know, I'm sorry, I have one. No, no more points. No oh. more points. Oh. We have to keep going. Elden Ring. Uh, I'll kick it off. I would put it on this list above Hard Space Shipbreaker and below Case the Golden Idol. Uh, Will, where would you put it? I would put it above Tinykin. Okay, Jake, where would you put it? Yeah, I'd put it above Tinykin. Uh, Kyle? Above Tinykin. All right, so let me put it there. And Will, you want to pick next game? Yes. Um, God, how can we go through this fast? Uh, Dwarf Fortress Steam. Uh, oh, boy. Dwarf Fortress. It's an incredible game. It's came out almost... 18 years ago they finally made it to steam they made it big those guys are getting all of the money they deserve uh for this game uh this is more of i like dwarf Fortress is so unique it shouldn't should be on its own list uh it is a crazy game that lets you do all sorts of dwarf things uh, you can check the toe of your characters you can see uh what happened 200 years ago on a sunday um, you can do all of this stuff and you can do it in a matter of seconds. Uh, and it's just absolutely wild. The systems in that game. Um, I don't think it's going to place anywhere high on this list. I just think it deserves the recognition it deserves as being one of those games that was so inscrutable for so long by so many people, including myself who made a video about it. And now that it's out on steam, it is so much far removed from that. It still has a ways to go. It is not perfect. It needs help still, but it is in a place where, again, people I would never expect to play a game like that are playing that game and enjoying it. Um, yeah, that's my piece. I um, so so just to push back a little bit, you said you know, hey, it. I don't think it's going to place on this list that high, but it deserves to be mentioned. I, I'm trying to think of Door Fortress has been in beta 
for what is it like 15 years 15 plus years it's been 2006 is when it came out so it's been in beta for 17 16 years and then it finally came out on steam but it's not even a 1.0 release and i yeah. I, th- I think about this as one of those games where by the time this becomes quote we don't subscribe to this but by the time this becomes quote unquote game of the year eligible because it has a 1.0 release <laughs> it's not really going to be relevant anymore. And so part of it is like, yeah, this is an older game. We're, we're all familiar with it, et cetera. But at the same time, this is the year that it deserves to be applauded and awarded because they have, they, they took a big leap. They said, you know what? Hey, we need some money. But at the same time, we recognize this game is not accessible, even though we've been building it like that for 16 years. So we need to make a new version of this game. And even though it doesn't have everything that the original one does, it has a lot of it. And it has more than enough of the charm here. Like Dwarf Fortress, I think about, um, I was not a big fan of Red Dead Redemption 2. And one of the praises for Red Dead Redemption 2 that really rang false for me, I believe it was Alex Navarro at Giant Bomb, who said that Red Dead Redemption 2 felt like a game where you couldn't, everybody in the world had their own life and you couldn't, you couldn't, you could only imagine the clockwork mechanism behind it, but you couldn't understand any of it. And I didn't think that was true for Red Dead Redemption 2. It had some polish on it, but it still felt like a very manufactured world. Dwarf Fortress feels like the true game that should apply to because every dwarf in your in your fortress has like such varied personalities and such little quirks. And there's so many different emergent types of scenarios and gameplay that can that can come out. And there's so many different mechanisms and mechanics and interacting game systems that this really does feel like the type of game where you will never fully understand the systems in this game. You will never feel like you are, you know, uh, reading the matrix. You know, you are just constantly like hanging onto the coattails of Dwarf Fortress and trying to maintain some semblance of sanity and order as this crazy fantasy world is unfolding in front of you. And honestly, because of that, this is the year we should be singing the fucking praises of Dwarf Fortress. And I don't feel ashamed at putting it high on our list i don't care that it's been out a while this is a big achievement for them this year and for all time really uh kyle jake did you guys get a chance to play dwarf fortress i did not and i'm sad to say that i it's it's one of the games that i really i literally (laughs) the last time we talked about it that i was on local chat you told me about the the polygon article ian where it's basically like here's how to Mm -hmm. make your dwarf fortress i still have that pinned on my browser so i i am (laughs) planning on playing it it does seem like the type of game that I would enjoy. Um, I just I have not gotten around to it, so that's that's it for me. Uh, same for myself for for technical limitations, other than you know I do I do want to play it, and I I edited Will's video about Dwarf Fortress, and I watched some of uh, you know y'all streaming it, and I do love it as kind of and this was sort of the thesis of the video that Will made about it a while ago uh, as a as a vehicle for emergent storytelling. Um, and so I, I do appreciate that it has, it has come to a place of being available to a wider audience. Um, and once I have the means to play it, I certainly shall. Um, but that n- nothing, nothing I know about it nor have seen about it would ca- have me do anything to detract from its placement on this list. Same. Will, where would you put it on the list? Oh, God. Um, I would put it above Tinykin. I would also. I I would put it above Elden Ring. We can have that fight later. So let's put it above Tinykin. Does that work? I have no qualms. Great. Jake, what's the next game? Um, I'll I'll pick the I think one of the last ones that I nominated. I want to talk about Citizen Sleeper. Let's do it. Uh, so I said this when I talked about Signalis. I I attach myself to games that provoke an emotional response from me. And Citizen Sleeper was definitely that from a storytelling perspective. Um, however, it is not just like a lot of the praise I saw it get, especially during the Game of the Year discussion, was about its storytelling. I know that um, it's like the the um the devs posted it's like th- 300,000 or 400,000 words after all the expansions got all the all the DLC free DLC got added to it so it's 
there's so much dense sci-fi storytelling there but it's also a very good game from mm-hmm. like a gameplay structure and, and gameplay like user experience the fact that it's this really dense um interconnected thoughtful um science fiction you know space opera almost um wrapped up in this really tight dice roll um like just super easily digestible moment to moment gameplay and storytelling experiences um i was going into it because i i i knew the dev from in other waters which i think was one of my favorite games from the year it came out which i believe was 2020 um being this really cool kind of again a mostly user interface driven sci-fi story um so i was going into it just knowing their pedigree um and then playing it and being really captured enraptured by the story right off the bat and then found myself unable to put it down because the gameplay was so addictive because it was just really simple and really tight and really concise um where you start finding yourself being like, okay, yeah, I can do one more. I can do one more. And then it's, you know, four hours later. Um, so I, I really loved Citizen Sleeper. The art design obviously was right up my alley. The music, a great soundtrack from Amos Roddy. Um, it's all really good. This, not to jump ahead, but this is my personally my game of the year, is still Citizen Sleeper. I know it came out pretty early in the year, um, but it's number one for me. Um, um, I- Go ahead, Will. I really like Citizen Sleeper. I beat it. Um, I 100% agree with you. It was the one more thing. It was the one more one more day with the dice roll. I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. Knock that out. And then you're like, oh, I couldn't quite do this. Okay, so one more day with the dice roll. Oh, I didn't get good dice. I'll do it. I'll do one more dice roll to get good dice. Um, and I formed relationships with these people mm-hmm. where I was like, Oh, let me go check on the fungus guy. Like, see where mm-hmm. he's at. Like, well, let me just have. Like, I don't need to eat his, at his shop, but I know my character enjoys talking to him, so I can I'm gonna it. go eat it. Yeah, I'll go yeah. eat at that shop. Um, there were a lot of those moments. I um, found like a, a, I think it was a lotto machine, and I was able to help him gain sentience, and then I put him in a ship, and there was all this different stuff. Um, had a, a such a fun time with that game. It, it really hyper focused all of itself into a good clean what six hours seven hours um yeah to get an ending yeah to get an ending and i went back ends. and got another ending actually a couple times um character design was great visuals were great um the way the like you could go into like the unseen world and do like hacking and stuff and i really enjoyed that part of it um i have made a conscious effort to read more in video games I have a tendency to skip dialogue, skip tutorial menus, and then complain that there was no tutorial. I hate reading in video games for some reason, and it's not an aversion to it. It's just like something pops up. I want to get it off the screen as fast as possible because I want to play the game. So I really took the time to read what the people were saying in this game and to listen to them and like get. And I think that really helped the emotional connection and probably why I don't get much emotional connection with games that are text heavy. because it, it, it works so well. Uh, and, oh, God, I'm just thinking about the endings I got now. It's because you haven't mm. played Fire Emblem enough. You'll, <laughs> oh, you'll get there. True. Fire Emblem, <laughs> but I also played this year, and I read everything because I was like, I need to know what's going on here. Awesome. Um, Kyle, did you play Citizen Sleeper? I, so I'm actually on, like, the precipice of falling down the hole that you guys fell. I'm, like, an hour in. I, I was basically, between work and everything, I didn't get enough time to play this specific game um and like two other ones on this on our our nominees list um but having said that the sort of blade runnery sci-fi is ish aspects of the game i think are really cool like jake said the music is great the atmosphere the presentation i really dig and it's one of those games that it's like i just need like a like two days like of i just just jump back in and and, mm-hmm. and fall fall into it um you can kind of you can kind of feel that it's there like it's just like under the surface um i i really like what i've played but again i i haven't played enough to to form like a super strong opinion other than the superficial stuff that i mentioned i um i didn't like this game um 
Now, I'll admit a vast majority of that is this game just ain't it ain't for me. Um, I don't really like text heavy games, but I do think I have some objective criticisms with this. Uh oh. And, num- and number one is. There should not be that much text in any video game. No, boo. Uh, <laughs> there should not be. It's just it's the 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 fire escape cast. They have this fantastic concept of where they it's a really stupid dichotomy, but they talk about it a lot. They say, is it a Dewey game or a talkie game? And yeah. they're basically like, look, there are good talkie games, but a Dewey game is always better than a talkie game because you have a fucking controller in your hands. You know, and so sitting there and reading text on a screen in a video game is just counterintuitive to the idea of an interactive medium. Um, And I mean, there are definitely uh, areas where that doesn't apply or you have games that do it so well. But like playing Citizen Sleeper and talking to somebody and there's two paragraphs on the screen. I'm like, yeah, no, that ain't that ain't a chief. This ain't a video game. Um, and then honestly, the dice system, I did not like the dice system. It just felt very, very thin. It felt like a very thin layer on top of a choose your own adventure where what you wanted to do was present me with three choices and say, which one are you doing today? You can only pick one. But they decided to just put dice in front of it. And that felt very thin, which is a shame because I really like the world. I really like the look of it. I was starting to grow attached to these characters. But after an hour of playing it, I was like, Give me as look, give me this as a fucking book and I'm in. Give me this as a choose your own adventure book and I'm in. <laughs> but the video game is not the right format for that. And I know I'm in the minority there, but this was just this this was not a good game, but it had great writing, yep. great environment, etc. Um so in the interest of moving on, Jake, where where do you propose we put it on the list? Number one. <laughs> okay. Kyle, where would you put it? Um, I mean, again my limited time with it, I would put it under Cult of the Lamb, um, but above Signalist. So um, I think I would put it below Hard Space Shipbreaker and above TMNT. Uh, Will, where would you put it? God. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, you made a great point with the dice thing, uh, but I still I, I think you made a great point about it that I also agree with Kyle's point about case of the golden idol. It's just gameplay mechanics where you would rather enjoy it in a different medium, but I would still put it, I would put it below tiny kin. Okay. Where did you say Kyle? So it was, it? it was below cult of the lamb. I think that would put it where will right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's do Let's do below cult of the lamb. Uh, okay. It's now Kyle's turn. Okay, let's talk about Neon White, please. Uh, I really like, I really like this game. I come from a background of someone who loves movement-based games, specifically uh, Mirror's Edge is kind of what yes. kicked me off uh, getting getting onto that track. I like moving fast because I can't do it in real life very often. <laughs> um, and uh, there's some sort of addictive element to the flow of this game once you find it um that just clicked for me instantaneously and it took me it it took me a little bit to realize that i had actually reached that point so soon and i just started flying through levels um I, I love the iterative aspect of it where you can instantly just restart and tackle the same thing again. And, and it's all about perfecting that timing, the, you know, just, just making sure you're even looking at the, you know, the correct way. And it's, it's the little things that get you. It's like the, the missing, Oh, I should have, I should have pointed my mouse up a little bit higher. And then you just remember that log for next time, go tackle complete. Did I beat my friends? No. Okay. Go back complete. Did I beat, Ian, yes, okay, good. I'm good. I'm good to move on. And you, <laughs> I think you were only Ian. I think yours was. You did the first chapter. Yeah, I only the, did the like first, ten missions yeah, before yeah. I bailed on and that. Then, and then your 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 name stopped coming up, and I was like, oh, <laughs> like because you were you were one of my only other friends that played it. So like it was basically just yeah. you, me, and like one other random guy who I don't know were on the leaderboard. So I kind of lost my what what's my ratio for like getting like the top tier of, of this level. Um, but it was it was just 
for, for something that that was so inherently movement based, it really clicked with me. And then the ridiculous, I again talked about this on local chat, the ridiculous story that is extremely self aware. It knows what it's doing. It knows that it's really stupid and like it's it's ridiculous and over the top. And um, that's not going to work for everybody. I totally get that. Uh, and I I I think I'm okay with say saying how much it did work for me. Um, and just. I keep coming back to the gameplay. I, I'm waiting for them to release like DLC because I just want to keep going. Um, I love I love the card system that they implemented. I think it changes up the normal flow of of games like that, like Mirror's Edge, where Mirror's Edge is just obstacle based, where this is obstacle card and and somewhat uh, like uh, li linear linear base. I guess I don't, it's like you you can tackle things from angles you didn't think you could tackle them uh once you once you realize certain things and and that sort of opens up the gameplay space i think to a really interesting really interesting angle so that's my piece for neon white really like to uh, enjoy the hell of it will or jake did you guys play neon white well oh, oh no I, I was i was just well i was gonna say no but hearing people talk about it on podcasts and stuff and hearing even what kyle said and i know what ian is gonna say um <laughs> All of that in my mind together is that this is a fantastic gameplay run based Mirror's Edge type running game with a story and writing that really didn't work for people or really worked for people. And that is the like I, polarizing thing of it. Yeah. A genuine question, though. I don't know that the writing really worked for anybody. I think the most I've heard was people just being like, yeah, I'm OK with it. No, it but I think it <clears throat> it it. It gave context enough to the to the game that I liked it. I wasn't in love with it, but I also don't think that's the main draw of right. the game. So it, it's kind of secondary to the gameplay anyway. And I'm I'm totally fine admitting that. I think the developers would admit that. Like it's I don't know. Yeah. And I, I, I will say that is more what I meant. Like people will tolerate it more and like go through it like the same way I see scenes from animes that people love and I just want to jump. <laughs> yeah. But um but like save data and david like even he admitted that first character that you quit on i think ian is what he, is the most annoying character he found and was like oh the rest of it's okay but like even some of them were higher on it and but I, from everyone the gameplay is what i've heard from everyone it's um th this game is it's it's weird because kyle like i came from the same place you know love movement based games especially the ones that are all about like you know super meat boy restart 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 quick restart yeah. man even even something like like counter-strike source surf where you're just like one with the movement and you're doing some crazy shit through this level um and so i really really wanted to love this game and it was kind of a unique experience where i streamed the very first time i played this game and like i mentioned earlier we very rarely end a stream early and i think that stream lasted 25 minutes because this game is this game has two halves to it. Um, I, I don't necessarily buy your point, Kyle, that the story is there, but you can kind of ignore it and it's not a big part of the game. It's half. I didn't say game. I didn't say it's not a big part of the game. It's not the point of the game. I, I don't yeah. I think the the movement through the level and the perfecting of the level is the main focus and the story is secondary. Yeah, I, I think I would barely agree with that because my experience was they would do you know, I wasn't skipping dialogue and they would give you like five minutes of one of the most excruciating conversations and cutscenes I have ever seen in a video game. And, and you know, to your point, it, it is intentional. There is something it is making fun of. But to, there to is be also fair, there's literally a fast forward button <laughs> like I, it's, I, it's I don't, right I don't there. <laughs> I don't I don't care because to, 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 to my point, though, it's OK to make fun of something. But there's a point where you go so far in making fun of something that you become the thing you are trying to make fun of. And every single line of dialogue in that game was god awful and the delivery and on top of it. And once you're in the game, you're playing the game and you're great. And then all of a sudden you get dumped back in the world and you're like, shit, now I have another cutscene. And if you skip it, you feel bad because you're like, well, shit, now I'm skipping half the fucking game. And then you you start to kind of go around to the different areas and the different stores and the different people you're interacting with. And every single one of them is god awful. So this game is like like one half of it is fantastic. And the other half of it is like straight garbage. And it's like like to your point, that's a 
that's a that's a huge problem for a game when you feel like you have to skip or speed through half of it because of how annoying and bad it is just to get to the good stuff. And that's that's what really put me off about that game. I was like, you know what? I got other games to play. I don't want to like skip half this game. If you can't make half the game good, then me personally, you don't deserve my time. And that was a real shame because I honestly went into that wanting to absolutely love it based on the reaction. And yeah. I just could not, could not, could not handle it. Um, I, I think that's fair. But um, Jake, did you have anything? To this say? was another one that unfortunately I was not disciplined enough in the I have all these games to play before this discussion. And I just played 100 hours of Elden Ring because I wanted to get through it so that I could I, I wanted to get through it so I could write my script about it. Um, so. No, unfortunately, I did not. <laughs> Though I, I, I know Ben Esposito of. Uh, I don't know if he was the game director or what, um, but I'm familiar with you know, the, the. Mm-hmm. I, I want to go back and I want to play some mm-hmm. more of the Arcane Kids games mm-hmm. and then play Neon White because yeah. I'm sure there is a through line there. Um, I don't think so, honestly. Well, Ben Esposito was big with Arcane Kids. Um, no, I know, I know, but Arcane Kids was just like off the wall, fucking weird. And I know. Neon White is just like we're gonna do a really cringy Western anime I, style with I'm, Persona, and it's like, well, I'll see after my research <laughs> if there's anything. There. <laughs> but um, yeah, I I um, I definitely would like to get around to this at some point. I'm not sure it's going to be for me gameplay wise or otherwise, but um, I really like the look. Of it. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea of it. All right. So Kyle, where would you put it on the list? Honestly, this is going above tiny kin for me personally. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, this is going to be tough because uh, shame on you, Will and Jake for not playing this. Cause I would, I would put this down below hard space shipbreaker i think that's fair so that puts it i would say above signalis if we're just splitting the difference sure yeah yeah yeah. that's that's fine it's your own fault jake i know <laughs> God damn it. again this list is not final we're gonna rehash it at the end but this is why we all gotta play these games so we can we can have a good discussion i tried then the um, I- ring was too compelling all right let's talk about um Vampire Survivors. Um, this game is hella effing good. I, what I love about this game is it's it's a continuation of my tirade against AAA games that has just grown in fervor and evidence over the last couple of years, which is basically that AAA games throw a lot of money and effort and marketing and big, huge staffs at a game, and they end up with something that is just like a real middle of the road medium. And then you end up with something like Vampire Survivors, which started out as a dollar 99 game on steam i believe it's up to three or four dollars now and is just a fucking flash game (laughs) and it is absolutely incredible um you know this is they fully admit this is a clone of a less popular mobile game but to be fair they did like add a whole lot of stuff on it this they did not create but they have basically perfected and popularized the ass genre the auto shooter survival genre and like the amount of like things that are going on in this game, just the core gameplay loop being so addictive and satisfying. And then the more you play it, you start to realize like, oh, my God, there's like systems on systems on systems here. There's like hidden stuff all over the place. It's just very, very satisfying. Um, I will say some of the lows, though, which is there is a bit too much obscurity in this. I actually put the game down several times and then I would hear somebody be like, oh, yeah, Vampire Survivors, the Arcana. And I would be like, what? what system or they'd be like the limit break and you'd be like Mm -hmm. what i never got to that and i would have to google it and then go to the game and unlock it and i started playing the game with like charts and windows open on the side because there's just a little bit too much obscurity in this game to the point where you can think you have played the game you you don't have to 100 percent the game but you can play like 10 15 hours of this game and think you've seen it in reality you've never touched these systems because it doesn't do a fantastic job of guiding you towards them uh, towards unlocking them and then the other problem is honestly towards the end I was still playing this game and it was not satisfying, but I was still playing it and it felt like a bad addiction. And quite frankly, I don't think that's good 
that a game can do that to you. And I do think that is a detriment. It's okay to be obsessed with the game. It's okay to keep playing it. But if you start to feel bad and you're not getting satisfaction from it, but you still feel like you need to scratch that itch, I think that's I think that's a little bit of predatory game design. Who, who else played Vampire Survivors? I played almost two hours of it. Um, that addiction is immediate. It yeah. is within like five minutes. I was like, okay, well, I'll just do one more. Like, I'm just, yeah. I'm just going to start over again because I need, to, I haven't learned. And the more I kept doing that, the more you start to realize, like you said, how deep those systems go. And some of them I didn't know about until I started watching YouTube channels where it was like, I don't know if I would have found this until, like you said, hour yeah. 10, hour 12, something like that. Um, so just knowing that there is such depth to it is cool. I do think I agree with you. They they need to do a way better job of explaining that or at least presenting that as like, hey, here's what's possible or like, here's some stuff you can do. Um, because if you just take it at face value, it's just an auto. It's just an auto shooter that looks really cool with a kick ass soundtrack. Um <laughs> And hey, just real quick. Thanks. Thanks for writing save data. We're talking about game of the year. Yo. Currently talking about vampire survivors. Kyle, you had some more to say. Yeah, um, just the 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 sprite design also, I think, is really, really well done. And the fact that they can get so many uh, so many sprites on at one time is awesome. But I read something and then found a YouTube uh, video that explained it a little bit better. The red gems are actually um, Pixel limits. When there's too many uh, experience points or experience orbs or whatever, they turn into red gems and stop populating. So, what's up, Chris? My God, uh, yeah. So uh, that just little little things like that that make the game flow smoother and and uh, I, I just had a really good time with it. I haven't beaten it. I'm nowhere close to beating it, but uh, it's it's pretty awesome. I do agree that there there are some definitely some detail issues that need to be ironed out. But as as a uh, you know, someone who's just ninety minutes, two hours in, it's great. Uh, um, Jake, yeah, I shut up. Well. He Ian Roger. called on me. I'll do. It. I'll go. Um, yeah, I so I I was actually just looking on my Xbox app to see how long I had played it. I played it eleven hours. Ooh. Um, and um, yeah, all the same things. Love the art design. Love the music. Love the. Uh, the unfolding nature of the gameplay systems, even though I'm sure even just hearing some of you talk about it, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. um, I had a lot of fun with it. I think it's, I, I, I would, I, I don't know. I think it's on the bottom for me. Just like, even though I had fun with it, it's just kind of, it is what it is. Can I? It, can I? It just is as add, it was. Add something real quick. I think I will stop around to the time you probably stop playing, Jake. Hmm. Like I think I that's think, probably my limit. Is like I unlocked hours. like twelve characters. I I got a bunch of. I was getting to the point where I was starting to get like the fusions of the of the combat items with the yep. support items to create the new thing. Um. Uh, yeah, it was like it was fun, but it was then you're like okay cool i appreciate i appreciate it for what it is at its price point <laughs> um and artistically and otherwise um but um it is what it is well what did you think um it's weird hearing you guys talk about it because i also i probably have like i don't even know anyways I, I like vampire survivors it does a good job um it has systems that I didn't know about that you guys were talking about. I played it a bunch. I never did a run after completing a run. I never wanted to. Um, I would I would do one run and then I would be done. Uh, it, it, really? It, it, I, I thought it would be more. I thought I thought maybe I would want to have another hit of it. But no, I, I would do a run. I would either lose or win. And I'd be like, OK um never i probably have like 10 hours in that game it's always one run at a time wow uh, okay that's I really interesting really... i i have 27 hours and i want to say the last 17 hours was in like three to four hour chunks where i would just sit down on a saturday and just play for like fucking four hours in a row um yeah. 
I don't know what yeah. it is. So I don't know, Jake, I'm going to call you out a bit. I, okay. I, I think your nonchalance about this game is a little bit elitist, quite frankly. Um, wow. And the, <laughs> the reason why I say that is it is very simple to look at this and go, oh, it's a fucking $2 flash game, yo. But like That's the amount of things being, the amount of things being done in this game, like almost to perfection in terms of like, just like, all the different systems playing off each other, like how good that combat feels, how good the different levels are, how how varied the weapons are, and then the weapon combos. Like, that's the type of thing where you could go, yeah, game design is easy, bra. And it's like, okay, well then make a fucking Vampire Survivors. Because that is not programmatically complex when you first look at it, but the design that they put in there, especially to get it to a level of addiction and satisfaction like that, is is hard to do. And so it's easy to dismiss this game, but in reality, there's a lot of brilliant game design going on in there. Sure, I maybe I maybe did not articulate myself very well because I am somewhat conflicted about this because I do feel a certain amount of nonchalance to it because it is at a surface level quite simple. But you are right; the systems are very complex. They're very thoughtfully put together. There is a lot of depth there. Um, but. <laughs> I don't know. There's just a part of me that looks at it and I, my brain just puts it in a box, which I, it shouldn't. I know that that's, that's a me problem, but um, I had fun with it. Um, I think maybe as I've said in the other ones, I didn't form an emotional connection with it. So it's like a fun gameplay thing. It's, it was great. Like I, I can't remember if you had said this for another game, you know, throw on a podcast or whatever, play a little bit of Vampire yeah. Survivors. Um, but um, yeah, it, it wasn't going to be in my um, up high on my list, not for any f- faults of its own, other than just that it is what it is. OK, so let's um, let's put it on the list then. Uh, as the person who picked it, I will put it. I. I propose that it goes. I propose that it goes above Tinykin below Dwarf Fortress. Will, where would you put it? I would put it. I would put it. Oh, God. (laughs) I would put it below the case of the Golden Idol. Jake, where would you put it? I would put it below TMNT. Would I feel kind of by default that I haven't played Stray, and so that's where I would put it. But um, uh, where would you put it? Um, I would put it. Ab- above Stray. OK, so I think split the differences below hard space and above TMNT. OK. I mean, we, you can split it a little bit more than that. Not really. I mean, you put it here and then somebody put it here and somebody put it here. Well, I figured you so take take my more than yeah, that's fine. No, again, for people watching, this isn't final. This is just getting us to a very rough list. And then we're going to put Vampire Survivors up. We'll put on the ring all the way at the bottom. Case of the Golden Isle at the top. <laughs> uh, Will, your turn. Pick a game, buddy. Is it? Oh, uh, yeah, I Pentiment. Vampire. I oh. love Pentiment. It was very fun. Um, also, now that people are joining us, I don't know if it'll come up, but this is their spoilers abound. So. If you haven't played Pentiment, get lost and go play it. Uh, Pentiment, it is an uh, art style, first of all, is per- Super is cool. genius. I love it. I love that kind of art style. It's something you see all the time everywhere in history books and stuff. And you never really get to appreciate it up close. Um, and I feel like this game really puts it on display. The fontography. Always love when a game starts with font selection. It's great. <laughs> what? What is that called? It's not calligraphy. No, I guess it is calligraphy. A, no, it's, written, it's, right? it's fonts. So, it calligraphy is a very font. specific type of writing style. Oh, oh okay. Um, Anyways, it's uh, fonts. Uh, they're great. I think when the game initially came out, the fonts didn't fully load in all at the same time. They were written slowly out. But by the time I played the game, they had changed it to where the full like, thing comes out first, then it starts getting filled in. Um, Cause I remember hearing some early complaints about that. Anyways, the fonts are cool. Uh, it's medieval 1500s right after Martin Luther uh, in Bavaria, Bavaria, Bavaria. Yeah. Southern Germany. 
uh, southern Germany. Uh, you are Andreas, a traveling artist. Uh, you are visiting this town of Tassing, which has an abbey in it. There's a murder. you got to solve the murder. Um, you talk to all the people in the town, solve the murder, come back in chapter two because you're visiting again. You got this guy with you, this little assistant. There's another murder. You got to solve and there's an uprising and all this sort of stuff. You got to solve all that. And then you come back as one of the village people. Uh, the <laughs> Which one of the village people? The construction <laughs> workers? The construction or the worker. <laughs> no, Jeez. it's a Native American. And, mm. uh, and there's another whole chapter of that solving stuff. Um, it really worked for me. I was, I also get easily emotional in things. Uh, I, I don't think I full on cried at the end of it, but I definitely had some tears. Manly tears. Uh, I thought it really connected well at the end and came to fruition. <laughs> I guessed the killer at the beginning um, and I wasn't 100% correct at who it was, but I knew that person was involved uh, and it still didn't really ruin it for me because I, I, I had a great time. I also just wait, accused wait one I gotta... person. Because we, we didn't talk about spoilers about this all year. How How did you... Are you talking about you're talking about Father Thomas? Yeah. How did you pick him in the first? Because I've been racking my brain. I'm like, I must have missed something or not gone down a path that would have pointed him out in the first act. So in the first act. I, I don't remember as clearly what my thing was in the first act, but in the, the, the thing that was clear in the second act is he would come to all of the scenes late. And oh, yeah, or he wasn't there when things initially happened. He was always the one who came in and gave an excuse of something. And I was gotcha. like, oh, that like, I think it's him. And full spoilers, it's him using the girl in the. Wall he, he's, room. he's having her right. Yeah, because she thinks she's doing it for religious reasons. Yeah. But um, it was still nice to see that happen. So every chapter I would go to him and be like, can I present something to him? Because these chapters, you can't, you can't so actually solve them. You're just given options. Um, but yeah, the father Thomas thing, I was just like, I, he has to be involved. It's something with him. And it was nice that I didn't fully get it because then when she revealed her stuff, I was like, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's how you did it. Um, but I wasn't fully there. I gotcha. think okay. I have Benjamin. to go back and check my footage, but I think he might take the knife from brother pietro in the abbey like as everybody's gathered around i think he might take the knife and leave um yeah i believe i could so. be making that up but yeah um i played i played pentiment i i think uh okay first of all pentiment is a game i should hate uh because it's very text heavy uh and there's not a lot of gameplay in it but the writing in this is so phenomenal and i think what makes it great in and something that really like just struck me dumb uh, it hit really home for me in act one is um, you go to present your evidence and we are we are 21st century babies. Right. So we are we have this concept of modern legality and what is evidence, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's not this game. Uh, motherfuckers, this game don't care about modern legality. It's like, look, you tell me some gossip. I'm going to use that enough to hang somebody, you know? <laughs> so you go These into this. Said. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, okay, we got to find somebody good enough. Boom. Take them out. I'm, I'm judge, jury and executioner over here. And that is fantastic. I don't think there are many games that would have the balls to do that, to be like, look, no, we're going to present like, like a historically accurate conception of like justice and accusation, et cetera. And, and we're not going to allow the player to solve the fucking crime when they think they have, but we're going to force them into a situation where they have to decide if they're going to present evidence or not. And it's, it's very good. And I think the other thing it does really well is all the characters. There are so many different characters in this game. Um, I think a vast majority of them felt like unique, interesting characters. They're all across like, like uh, class spectrum, uh, personality spectrum, uh, political spectrum. And I think what really came across from this with me was like small towns matter too. You know, I, I come from I come from Carroll County, Maryland. Now, I don't really come from, but that's where I spent the most time growing up. And the thing about Carroll County, Maryland was it was 98 percent white and it was like rural farmland. And the perception of the county was that everybody there is racist. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, there is there is a decent amount of racism in that county because, you know, we don't have a lot of minorities, but not everybody in that place is racist. You know, and there are people to this day, friends from 
not not friends, but people I know from high school are just like, I'm so happy I'm out of racist Carroll County. Everybody there is a conservative idiot. And it's like, no, like even in these small towns, everybody is a person and they have complications. And even if you may not agree with them and they may do terrible things, there is still like complexity and personality and some sort of self justification behind that. And so in, in playing through Pentiment, it's like it's like. Peter's like a rough asshole and he keeps choosing to do the wrong thing. But you totally understand why, because he's the poorest person in town and things are just getting worse and worse for him and nobody's doing anything. And in his mind, he knows exactly who's causing all his pain. And it's just like it it just does a fantastic job of presenting all these characters. Just, you know, honestly, I think it's the best video game writing I've ever experienced. Just absolutely layers and layers of layers of depth and complexity and personality. Kyle, you played you played Pentiment. I did. I like Pentiment quite a bit. Um, again, presentationally, um, I think the almost literal rewriting of history that you do at the very beginning, the very first thing you do, sets a really interesting tone for the rest of the game. And then what unfolds by the end of it, which again, spoilers, uh, where you find that the, the town is basically built on heresy, literally, like built on top of it. Um, there was there was some wild things that happened within the story that I I was not expecting. I will I kind of did what you did where I was like suspecting Father Tom and I was like, yeah, like like he's too he's too involved in everything to not have something to do with it. Um, but um, yeah, the the some of the, I thought the first act was a little slow, and I get that it's sort of putting you into this world and you're getting used to to how things are unfolding, different gameplay mechanics. Um, I didn't necessarily enjoy that that sort of pacing, um, but it definitely picked up, especially Act 2. I definitely, uh, uh, you know, I, I called some of the fake outs that they did. Um, I don't want to spoil, like, everything. Um, I, I don't know. I, I had a good time with it. I, I will say that the writing was phenomenal. I mean, Obsidian, if they do one thing right, it's it's writing. And uh, I think that this game is a standout as far as that goes. But there were some little quibbles I had. But overall, I really enjoyed my time with it. And I'm, I know we're pushing past almost two and a half hours. So uh, that's all I'll say. And I'll, I'll give it to Jake. Yeah, I also very much liked Pentiment. I think it because I, um, I don't know. The, I, I, I initially, I bounced off it at first, and I think I might have mentioned that in, in the Subpixel Discord or on, on local chat or something, that I played like an hour or two of it, and then I put it aside, and then I went back to it a couple of days later, and then I just, then it was like right at a turning point where I could really just dive right into it. I did sort of role play the first time through Andreas as like a really legalistic Catholic, <laughs> um, where, you know, that, the, that, you know, the rich guy shows up and he's like, Hey, what do you think about Martin Luther? And I'm like, buddy, it's an asshole. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about Martin Luther. Um, and cause the, the first guy that I get trying to kind of, uh, I mean, trying to find who I thought actually did that first murder, but then also kind of role playing as okay, who am I going to accuse? Because there's the you have pretty compelling evidence that one of the nuns before the events of the game, one of the nuns in this abbey was assaulted by this rich count, and there's pretty compelling evidence that maybe she killed him. But I'm like, you know what? If you did, that's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. But this other monk is doing some occult business in the woods. Yeah. And that God will not like. So I'm going to point the finger at that guy. And then that guy got executed in the oh, town I didn't square. Find that. Oh, yeah, buddy. I, I it's, a big, that. it's a big reveal at the end, right? Where he's being like coerced into doing it by. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, um, he's, yeah. The count is like. Yeah. He's somewhat, yeah, he's like twisted his arm into doing some occult business in the woods. Yeah. But I'm like, hey, buddy, occult oh. business is occult business. And if you're doing blood <laughs> rituals in the woods, mm, maybe you should not be a man of the cloth anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. No, yeah, I, I, I like the music. I loved the, the, I love this, the sound design. Mm. There was, it's, you know, it's very text heavy. I think it very, 
were it to have a different budget and not kind of be this weird experiment that Obsidian was doing, they might have gone with a full voice cast. But I'm kind of glad that they didn't, because what they do do is certain characters, like all the monks, when their text populates the screen and so there's really fancy ornate text, you can it sounds like a quill mm. writing on really thick parchment. And your friend, the the guy who runs the print shop when he talks it's the sound of like wood blocks falling into place i'm like that's really really cool and then also i mean just this the sounds of the world the 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 changing of your footsteps on different surfaces the sound of like being in the abbey this kind of reverberant big stony structure especially when there's that storm and this you know all the patter of the rain and everything you know the wind in the forest it's all very good and Ian, like you said, I think it's it's some of the best game writing in a long time. Mm, I do yeah. want to wag my finger at you, though, for liking this and not liking Citizen Sleeper. But <laughs> I get it. Um, um, I just want to say yeah, to fair. your point, just to quickly add with the font thing, it, it also changes when uh, Andreas's perception of the character changes. Oh, yeah, that's like, very cool. They'll initially write like shittily and then he'll learn that like, Oh, you're a well-read man. You know how to write. And then it'll change to the nice writing. And then I think there's one character that it changes as they get older. They're like, Oh, I started working at the printing press. So it changed their text to the printing mm-hmm. press. And you're like, Oh, that's really neat. But it, it's changing. It's very, cool. well, it's very good. Where's he going on the list? It is going. I'm sorry. I, it, for me, it's number one. Okay. Top of the list. Jake, where's he going? Yeah, the list as it stands right now, I would put it above Elden Ring. Uh, Kyle, where's he going? Above Neon White. Um, And I would put it above Tiny Kim below Dwarf Fortress. Um, can we can we put it there right now as a compromise above Tiny Kim below Dwarf Fortress? Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's do that. Uh, Jake, your turn to pick a game. Um, let's do a uh, card shark. This is a, a little bit of a weird one. Cause I think I added it to the list, even though I didn't finish it and I did kind of frustratingly give up on it, but I really appreciated what it was doing for the time that I spent with yeah. it. I, I watched the um, local chat where, where Ian, you talked about it. Um, and you mentioned things that I never encountered. Like I didn't get to a point where I lost all my money and died and had to do anything with death. Um, that sounds really cool. But um, eh. uh, I got to a point where I, I like for similar reasons to Pentiment, I really, I liked the art style of this. And I think a lot of this was actually hand drawn and then scanned. Um, so a lot of the backgrounds are like hand drawn and hand watercolored. Um, and scanned in, which is really cool. Um, I loved what it was doing for being like a card game that's not really about poker. <laughs> it's about being fraudulent at poker, and there's a lot of interesting mini games. But it got to a point where it sort of overcomplicated itself, and you'd get yeah. to a point where you'd have to do like three or four scams in the course of a single session, and it got to a point where I I I, I don't remember if I if I could have changed, if there was a difficulty slider or not, there but it is. got to a point I, where, yeah. I, yeah. So just to say, I, I went back a little bit and I put the game on low difficulty, but it's still, that does not solve all the problems. It still feels a bit clunky when you're in the moment and you're trying to actually implement all these. I feel like I needed flashcards <laughs> like to lay out <laughs> yeah. in front of me because yeah. I really liked it for a long time. And then it got to a point yeah. where my brain was just kind of turning to mush, trying to remember I mean, I guess it means I wouldn't ever be a good con artist. <laughs> I was say, yeah, it's hard to scam people, it yeah. turns out. It's hard. Hard to scam Voltaire, famous philosopher. Yeah. yeah, so this game, like like I said on local chat, like this game has great style. It's a pretty cool little story. And the wildest fucking part about this game that still blows my mind is that it's teaching you how to cheat at cards. Mm-hmm. Like literally the things that I have learned I can do those in real life now. Some of them I would have to practice because they involve finger manipulation. But like I talked about before, one of them is literally just the order of the cards that you pick up off the table. 
mm-hmm. uh, when you, when you're about to shuffle, and it's just like wild. Like one yeah. of the, one of the one of the things I really love is those Penn and Teller books where they're like how to cheat at cards, you know. And you read it, and you, and you it's like a combination of card tricks, but also stories about cons, etc. And like that's great, but the actual implementation of that into a progressive game where you are doing things and advancing etc is not super well done so it's it's a really cool premise just not that well implemented um kyle will anything to say i did not play this game yeah i didn't either i thought it looked interesting based off of uh jake's now description and your description on local chat but i was literally going to pick it up until you got to the point where you're like it gets too overwhelming and i was like okay i won't touch it yeah yeah uh, Jake, where would you put Card Shark? Uh, I mean, it's weird because the caveat of it getting so complicated that I felt like I couldn't finish it feels like it should be at the bottom. But personally, I would want to put it above Vampire Survivors. I I would put it at the bottom. I mean, honestly, let's That's do a little fair. negotiation here. We both bounced off that game way before we should have. I think that yeah. puts it no, at that's the fair. bottom. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, Kyle. Down to two games, which which one you want to talk about? Let's talk about Tunic, the little game that could. Um, Tunic is like if Zelda met Dark Souls, met uh, Metroidvania, met so many other things like that. Yes. It's kind of crazy that it actually works. Um, I I have not beaten it, to be clear. Um, it's very good. I like a lot of the puzzles. I like the sort of um, the mechanics that it uses. Uh, I mean, it's 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 hard. It's hard for me to describe it. One, because I don't have enough experience with it, like a lot of these games that we talked about that are sort of at the 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 middle of the list. Um, But hearing other people and watching a lot of other people play. um, It's definitely one I want to go back in 100 percent and and I can't wait to do that, but I liked what I did play for the the two and a half, three hours that I that I played of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I can say. Will, I feel like you're going to have a slightly differing opinion. Um, So I sorry, I was literally just trying to check how many hours I had in it. Um, I, I like Tunic. I like what it did. I made it so it's got a hurdle in it. I made it past the thir- first 30, 45 ish minutes. So I've I've almost nine hours in it. Um, when you first get the, and then you finally get the sword and then that game feels good before you mm. get the sword, the game feels like a, you're it's, it's worse than dark souls one. You just, it's stupid. Yeah. You want to go exploring this cool Island. The music is bangerang all around. Um, like every environment I've been to has fantastic music and you're like, I just want to walk around this lovely place. Oh, these stupid enemies suck. Um, and so I eventually wandered into the forest, got my sword. Um, and that's when the game gets really good. Uh, I had heard before that there's like text or uh, booklet pages you get that you need to figure out. There's also like hidden entrances to things. So that's all I knew going in. So basically I was hugging the walls the whole time, not really finding anything. I'm like, okay. So you get these gorgeous booklet pages of like Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo era game booklets where it's just like telling you the story of the game, uh, what everything means, what all the buttons do, but it's all in language that you cannot read. So it's like inference stuff. So as you're finding those, you're piecing stuff together, you're finding them at the right moments uh, where it's kind of usually the next thing you have to go do, or it'll teach you a mechanic that you didn't realize. So for a bit of the game, you can't upgrade anything. You don't know how to upgrade anything. And then finally you get the page that's like, Oh, hit RB at the, at the bonfire equivalent and you get to upgrade your character. You're like, Oh, okay. So you do that. And then later on, it's like, how do I use these stupid golden pads? And finally you get a thing where it's like, Oh, just hold a, you hold a for three seconds. Your character starts glowing and you can blast through it. So it's these neat, like mechanics where you can, uh, Ian's already annoyed because he thinks that's unfair. (laughs) Um, So it's these neat mechanics that you could, do them early on because uh, you might be in a second game or new game plus or whatever, and you can go through them or any other game would just be like, Oh, unlock the ability to do this, save up and unlock the ability to do this. But this game sort of cleverly put it together where it's like, it's there. You could do it. If you want to, you could accidentally hold a 
for three seconds and go through this thing, but you didn't. Um, I'm again, I'm nine hours in. I hit a part that was not fun at all. Uh, there was an extremely incredible emotional part that was awesome, followed up by an area that was a nightmare. Uh, I eventually turned on f uh, no fail mode uh, and I just ran through it, fighting everything as fast as possible. And then I got out of that and I have not touched the game since. Um, so Tunic, it's very good, very good music, great gameplay after the first 45 minutes uh, and cool mechanics. But uh, yeah, that's about it. That's my experience. I, I played the first 90 minutes of Tunic and based on what I had played and based on what everybody had said about it, I knew this. I knew this game was bullshit. Um, <laughs> when, when you started describing, like, I knew some of the stuff was hidden, but hearing, like, the explicit details of it, like, hey, the upgrade, the upgrade menu, it was there the whole fucking time. We're just not going to tell you how to do it. It just reminds me of fucking Kingdom Hearts 2, where you can't dash and you can't sprint, and, like, some of your jumps are locked behind, like, equipable unlocks that you have to get later in the game. And it's just, like, that's a basic fucking part of the game. Just because you hit it behind some mechanic doesn't mean you're fucking clever. It just means you're deliberately being an asshole you know like you're not even you're not hiding something cool you're hiding something basic that that's that's just very very frustrating to me and i feel like tunic is a lot of like these isn't that so clever moments and half of them are clever and the other half of them are pretend clever where they have taken something plain and just decided to do it in a weird way and hearing all of that and the experience that i went through i'm like hey I, I guess if you went through this, you would think that's clever because it revealed it to you. But for some of this stuff, I'm like, you never should have fucking hit it in the first place. So I so it's almost this game where I'm like half of it. I'm like, I, I appreciate the risks that it's taking. But the other half of it, I'm like, this sounds pretentious uh, in how it's tried to implement that. Jake, did you play any any tunic? It's on my switch. But no, <laughs> it's on Game it's, Pass, um, too. Just to like, no, yeah, I know. I wanted counter. to have a casual thing. But OK, just to counter that a little bit, I, like I agree with you, I understand like the pretentious nature of it, all that sort of stuff. But also it could just not be there like you, it could just be un, it could just unlock like they obviously want you to have it at that point. So would you rather know yeah. that this unlock coming or just like there's a cool thing where it's like, oh, hey, those things you've been looking at for a while, this is what you do with them. So 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 if there's something weird in the environment and it does something very fucking weird, like teleport you across the map, I am all for obscuring that. But if it is basic fucking gameplay, like upgrading your character or even just like I like I remember part of the manual was just like, hey, you got these items. We're not going to tell you what they do. And you're just like, this looks like a yeah. berry. Is this a health item? What does this do? I don't know what it does. Just obscuring basic fucking information that they should just tutorialize is very frustrating hide but, the cool stuff but not the normal stuff my counter to that is you don't know you can upgrade your character until they tell you i i feel like i kind of knew but to be fair i don't know if it was because i was spoiled or because i was genuinely yeah like i didn't know it. that like you can hit that rb menu whenever you want at the thing you just don't yeah. know what to do with the stuff until you find the first item and then you find the book page that tells you what to do with the item yeah, I, I just feel like half of it is cool obscurity. Half of it is is obscurity for the sake of obscurity. Um, anyways, anything else to talk about Tunic before we put it on the list? OK, uh, Kyle, where would you put it on the list? Um, having played of what I played of it, honestly, I'd, I think I'd put it above Stray. OK, I think I. Yeah, I think I would also put it above Stray. Uh, Will, where would you put it? Uh, I would put it above Neon White. OK, Jake, where would you put it? I don't know. I'd abstain. <laughs> abstain. That's fair. So that puts it, I think, I think, I think that puts it above Hard above space? TMNT or above Vampire Survivors. What I think are you guys feeling? I, think uh, it's a... I would put it above Vampire. Yeah, I think that's where okay. it would go. Uh, let's talk about nobody saves the world. Um, was this the first game? This was the very the first game, the very first game. Yeah. This was a game pass game out of nowhere, an indie game 
uh, early January last year. And um, quite frankly, this was my game of the year until Case of the Golden Idol came out in October. Uh, September, October. Uh, Nobody Saves the World is it's kind of like Tunic. It is a Zelda like um, you have a world. You have a bunch of people in the world with different quests. You have different enemies. Um, what Nobody Saves the World does really, really well is it really innovates on that gameplay style. Um, it, it kind of innovates on that classic Zelda, but also RPG genre because you're picking different they're called jobs in the game, I believe. Jobs or roles. And the idea is... Um, or forms? You, oh, yeah, forms, forms. You pick a form, and that gives you certain skills. So, for example, one of my favorites was the bodybuilder. So you pick the bodybuilder, and you you do little push-ups. You push out with the barbell. And I think you have one or two other things, and you have some passives along with it, You know, like your health is higher. But they do something really crazy a couple hours into the game, which is they're like, hey, hey, Come over here, kid. Hey, what if we let you mix and match the different skills and abilities from any of the forms? And all of a sudden you're like, holy shit. What if I can bench press as the the, the health as the, the weightlifting guy, but I can also back kick like a horse, you know, and, and then you're like, but I also want the ability from this from the snail or whatever, so that every time I attack somebody with the with my special attack, they get poisoned, you know, and then I want the other one that gives me like double poison damage so that when they explode and you're just like mix and matching these combos like crazy, like like that is just so much fun. And honestly, I'm going to find it hard to play any other Zelda type game or any other like class rpg based game without being able to mix and match like that feels just like such a revolution um like the environment and the world is so much fun to explore it gives you such like open-ended progression like there's usually at any given skill level there's usually like five or six areas around the map you can go like at your skill level just below it a little bit above it every time you're going around you're finding these like weird characters and weird quests um the ui is incredible because for each of these forms, you're trying to level up the form so you unlock more of it and then unlock forms above it. It's like a form skill tree, basically. And so you'll have forms like, you know, going back to the body lifter, it's like, hey, uh, you know, kill three enemies with a single bench press and you have to do that three times. And you're like, boom, I want to do that challenge. It's now on your screen the whole time, you know, in the top left. So as you're running around, you constantly are working towards unlocking those little challenges. Um, and it just makes it so easy. It feels so good to level up those those forms and get new forms and do all those little challenges. To be fair, on the lows, though, I think the story is a bit so so. I kind of mostly ignored it. Some of the dialogue is clever. Some of it's not. And it's just kind of a generic save the world type thing. Um, and it does feel a bit too long. I probably played like 15 hours of it and I didn't finish it. But I was really enjoying what I what I was experiencing with it. This feels like one of those games that could have just been another zelda like but they are trying very much so and delivering on revolutionizing that genre with the form system and the mix and match of it who else played uh nobody saves the world i rolled credits on it um and i i because it was it was that first one that you had added to the list and it was on game pass i'm like okay i had like just gotten my xbox i'm like all right let's play nobody saves the world i had a lot of fun with it i thought like like you said, when you get to the point where you can start mixing and matching the abilities with any of the forms, I thought that really kind of opened it up. Yeah, I like the variety of the the worlds. I think, like you said, the story is just like it's there, it's serviceable, it gets you from point A to point B. Um, I think Jim Guthrie did the soundtrack. The soundtrack is very good, um, but I think that I think the 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 forms and the ability combos do a lot to carry you through to the end um more so than i think anything else i had a couple of moments in navigating through the world where i could see a space on the map that i needed to get to but i couldn't figure yeah, out so how to get that there good. Um, that was fun but um yeah i had a lot of fun with it though i i this was one of the first ones i'm like i had a lot of fun i got all the way to the end i don't know if it's my game of the year or even in my top 10, but um, I did really like it. Uh, this was the first game I actually played on a Steam Deck. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, my, I, I, I didn't beat it, and I've only played like maybe 90 minutes, maybe. Um, but I helped my friend get 
windows on his Steam Deck and he has Game Pass. So now he can play Game Pass, Game Pass games on his Steam Deck. And this was one of the first ones that he downloaded. And um, it's really fun. He, he I think when I picked it up from him, he had already unlocked the 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 hot swap ability or the the uh, the combo ability. Um, the combat itself is really fun. The animations are like gorgeous. I mean, I love the art yeah. style. It reminds me a lot of scribble knots, but like more fluid and not vocabulary based. Um, it was really fun for what I for what I did play of it. But I I mean it. <sighs> I, something about it, I think maybe starting in the middle probably doesn't do it any justice, but like, I just didn't feel like it was sort of like a me game, like, like something that I would probably a hundred percent. Um, I might, I might go back and, and try it from the beginning, but it felt good. I just, I'm, I'm coming at it from a weird angle. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, I, um, I have oh maybe 10 hours in it. I think, um, I, I like it. I, I stopped because the combo stuff got overwhelming i didn't like all the choices i didn't like being able to pick that stuff and in the like the tree branching tree of unlocking all the characters kind of put me off as well um i understand like that's a good thing for a lot of people so i won't denigrate it for that but again the, the art style the music was great I, I liked walking around that world i don't play a lot of those types of like link to the past zelda games where you're just going around on the map doing all the things and everything like uh, to boil it all the way down um but i i did like the things it was doing i enjoyed the character like the the costumes before all that stuff like the horse i loved you just lock yourself running backwards kicking yeah the, the dropping <laughs> yeah. of the the thing like they were very clever classes that you would never think of um so i applauded on it was that just an egg <laughs> Yeah, even the yeah. egg is usable in some scenarios. And like yeah. the zombie just like slowly dies, and it's just like so <laughs> weird. Um, so I I did enjoy it. Uh, it, it uh, I didn't finish it, but um, it is a good game. Am I the only one who finished it? Probably. I think you. I think you are. It it, it, it is like 25, 30 hours to finish it, right? Mm, let me check. That's... I don't think it was that long, but I think I had like maybe fifteen. 20 yeah, in it. I'm trying to check right now. Nobody, you should go back and play some more of it. Nobody, nobody um, saves the world. I played for, oh yeah, 25 hours. Yep. Wow. Yeah. And that seems like coming. a really long time. <laughs> it, it, it's it long is constantly the, unlocking the stuff. Oh, okay. But yeah, it, it gets long in the end. All right, let's put it on the list. Um, since this was my talk, uh, I would put this above pentiment and below dwarf fortress steam will where would you put it in the list i would put it um i would put it above vampire survivors uh jake i would also put it above vampire survivors uh, i'm gonna abstain just because i i really haven't played enough of it to form a solid opinion so it'll be between okay. you three can i put it above heart space shipbreaker i guess it's a count again <laughs> we're we're about to shuffle all of these i know i know Twelve hard just, yeah well yeah I, th I think that's a good card um all right folks so let me do this if we're ready for it um what Ian i'm now gonna put some elden ring being done top by default <laughs> so here's what's gonna happen next uh this list is not final but this is a very good start for us to spend some time and look over this list and say, hey, maybe there's some stuff out of place on here. And I can kick it off. I don't think Elden Ring belongs at number one. And I think I have a very strong argument why. There's only one game on this list that all four of us played and all four of us sang the praises of. And that's Pentiment. I think we should, at a minimum, move Pentiment up to above Elden Ring. I will allow it. I will I not really, allow I, it. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree as well. So Kyle, you would leave Elden Ring at number one? I would leave Elden Ring at number one. Okay, so let, let's have a quick discussion. Okay. Elden Ring, very good game. It's number seven. This is the same shit they've done over and over again. Pentiment for me is something very new. And and as much as I I I would normally go against this game because it's so non-gameplay, 
the way that they have brought in gameplay, like the fact that you are not going to be able to do everything in this, the fact that they kind of pigeon you pigeonhole you into these assumptions that I can solve the case in act one and no, you can't. And the fact that the writing is so incredibly good makes me think of this as like like a crowning achievement in gaming that is new and unique and doing some very interesting things that no other games are doing versus Elden Ring is very good, but it's the seventh game in the series. So I feel like it's a crowning achievement in game writing, but not overall game accomplishment. Um, Elden Ring, you could say the opposite. It's, you know, fairly light on its lore, at least writing wise. For me, Pentiment has the opportunity to to grab the player and have them play multiple times. I didn't feel like I needed to go back and change the way I played, even though I know that, you know, many people probably do. I did feel that for Elden Ring, where I wanted to completely change how I had, I had approached things the first time. Um, that longevity, I think, is really important for me. And the fact that I kept coming back to Elden Ring and Pentiment, I was a one and done, was just the 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 reason why I would go over that. Is 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 Elden Ring what you want at number one? Yeah, I do. Uh, Will, Jake, what do you guys think? Um, I mean, I think maybe not as strongly as you, but I do feel like Elden Ring has some baggage of being of the FromSoft pedigree, where even though I haven't played any of the other ones, I do intellectually understand that it is just the most polished version of everything that has come before. Um, and I loved it for being someone who did not think they would love it and didn't initially love it. Um, but yeah, Pentiment if I'm going to be pigeonholed into into picking something that's not Citizen Sleeper or Signalis for number <laughs> one, um, I would definitely say Pentiment. Um, I had a, a moment where after that, after the first execution, I was like, oh, game's done. And then I'm like, uh, yes, it's exactly. still going. There's <laughs> yeah. more game happening. And, and, and um, at the end of Act 2, the same exact thing where I was like, oh, he died. Oh, that's such a great ending. Yeah, and I teared and up like, and then it started again. I was like, this fucking game won't end, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I I think it also plays to Pentiment plays to 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 me because I do I do come from a background of fairly theologically I, I this is the theological world of my childhood that uh -huh. I was able to bring knowledge and experience into Pentiment to be, I think there was like an added layer of appreciation of being like Steve Rogers. I understand that reference. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. To be I, fair, I, I bring, uh, Jake and I went to the same college. It was a Christian, <laughs> Christian university. Um, only one of us graduated. Uh, That's true. It was Kyle. <laughs> <Damn. laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't feel the attachment to Pentiment despite knowing a lot of the history and like, yeah, like the Martin Luther stuff is cool. Like the references to certain things are cool. I felt like I would rather lose myself in a world that was made up than one that was historically based. Sure. Um, I totally and that's, get that's that. why I'm, I'm more of more into the escapism of Elden Ring than I am into the historical relevance and, and intricacies of Pentiment. Um, I thought Pentiment again was written phenomenally well. Um, very, very good. But that's about where it ended for me. I didn't feel I even felt, I think, more emotional beating certain bosses at Elden Ring than I did at the story reveals and climaxes in Pentiment. Um, and I think that's why I'm holding on so hard for it is because it, and I mean, we've already got two versus one. So I think I know where it's going. But uh, that's just me saying my piece. Well, what would you what would you say? I mean, if there's any game on this list, I mean, other than Dwarf Fortress that I'm going to play for years to come, it's Elden Ring. Uh, but this isn't the game of the year of the game I'm going to play for the rest of my life. It's the game of the year that the game that made the most. No, that's why I didn't put 2022 Destiny 2 on this list. Uh, that's why you put Destiny. Yeah. 2022 uh, Pentiment. It hit all the right places again with both. Uh, with Well, more for Jake, but also with Kyle. I come from a huge theological religious background so like that really helped with that stuff and it was fun to sort of i played my character very loose um and saucy 
So like seeing that you sort of like see into hedonism, rebel yeah hedonism like that <laughs> rebellious nature of him was really neat. Did you seduce um, the nun? <laughs> seeing I'm not answering your honor. Uh, <laughs> seeing I want a framed poster of the scene of inside his mind with the three people. Yes, uh, like that whole. I want you know what I want to do. This is gonna, I want that, but I want the all the versions of that on top of each other, and it's pentimented away all yeah. the way to the original um, because you go there several times and it's changed. Um, so yes, Elden Ring. I love Elden Ring. I will play it for a long time. I will keep playing it. Um, I'm going to start a new game as soon as I can after beating it today. Uh, but I think the achievements of Pentiment with the tiny team, the incredible writing, um, the font stuff, all that sort of thing culminate in a game that just superseded itself this year. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, it comes down to this. This is a 10 out of 10 versus a 10 out of 10. Right. And I think for me, it comes down to me personally, it comes to game of the year. I always want to look for something that is pushing, doing something unique and trying to push the medium forward. And Elden Ring is doing that somewhat, but Pentiment is doing that wholeheartedly. Um, so that being said, Kyle, are you are you okay based on that discussion with us putting Pentiment I liked, above Elden Ring? I liked Pentiment. It's not better than Elden Ring in my mind, but I'm happy that it's on the list. So we're we're gonna do it's three on one. So let's yeah. let's do it. Rip the band aid. So uh, so s- in the spirit of that, Kyle, is there another game on this list that you want to move that you think is in a bad spot, either up or down, wherever you want to put it? Um, after honestly, after talking about a lot of the games as in-depth as we had. I want to move Tinykin down. Um, I think you're right. Like, I think it belongs more in like six, seven area. So tell me you would put it. Let's say let's you would put it below Citizen Sleeper above Neon White. That's six, seven. I think so. Yeah, because I really enjoyed Tinykin. Like, I liked it a lot. But I th- I think at the very least, it I think I enjoyed Cult of the Lamb much more um, and had a much more cohesive experience in just in my mind. Um, I just don't think it should be at number four. That's I think that's basically what it comes down to. OK, so um, let's go around real quick. Jake moving Tinykin down to below Citizen Sleeper above Neon White. Yeah, I mean, I would move it down much further than that, but I, I would. Well, how, there. how far would you move it? I mean, I just, I just really liked Signalis. How I would put it below that, but well, don't, don't rank it by the numbers. Don't rank it by the games that are listed. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's that's also a good point. because, yeah. like, oh, then... I don't want Tinykin below Cult of the Lamb, but that doesn't mean that's where Cult of the Lamb is staying. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can't think about yeah, it. So one, to, you... one to ten. Where would you put? Uh, I would put it seven so... or eight, probably. Okay. Yeah, and so that's that's around the same place. Kyle, yeah, I, I said six you... or seven, and you said yeah. seven or eight. Will, where would you put Tinykin? I mean, I would put it five or six. I, I think it's above Calls of the Lamb, but again, five or six. I, I think I would put it. I, I think seven. I think seven is the compromise everybody's saying. Okay. So it's going to go above Neon White, basically. Okay. Let me shuffle some stuff real quick, folks. Uh, Will? Or I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong order. Jake, you got anything that you think needs to move? I mean, I I would want <laughs> I I would want both Signalis and Citizen Sleeper to be much higher. Um, but that's again, I know those games are very a, a very niche interest to my particular tastes in science fiction and in, well, and well, in so video gaming. Let me let me just dial this in for you a little bit. Mm. Citizen Sleeper versus Signalis, which do you think should be higher? If it was just the two of them on the list, which one is higher? Citizen Sleeper. I would right? put Citizen Sleeper higher because I think for the okay. for similar arguments we've made about Elden Ring, I think Signalis is the best version of things that have come before it. Um, yeah. Whereas Citizen Sleeper is just like it's doing it's doing its own thing. Yeah. And I really really like it. So maybe just to keep this going. Let's just focus on Signalis for now because that is much lower. Where would you put that? 
I would put it above Tiny Kin. I mean, I I would put it five or six. If if this is the list, I would I would put it in the middle. Signalis at six. Any any objections to that? Uh, um, it sucks because I don't. I didn't enjoy it. Again, I didn't play it, play it, but I, I know how it ends. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Neon White, and I really enjoyed Neon White. So what if we put Tinykin below Signalis? We're just beating the shit out of Tinykin. Um, <laughs> I, I would be okay with that. I'm, I'm, Will, I'm Will you're shaking that. your head. Absolutely not. Will, Will uh, 100%ed Tinykin. <laughs> I would put Citizen put... Sleeper at number four. Well, okay, oh, we're getting ahead of ourselves now. <laughs> I think I'm just looking at six, seven, and eight. Is are we okay with that order? I, I'm going to throw another wrench in here. I would put I would put Signalis in seven, Neon White at eight. I see. I think Neon White should be above Signalis. In, I mean, in you swap Call to the Lamb and Citizen Sleeper, we can walk away at 11.56. Well, <laughs> we still need to talk about Case the Golden Idol, because oh, that, that fucker's way too low. Uh, okay, so so six, seven, eight. I don't think we have a compromise here. Are you okay with it still being like that, Jake? I mean, emotionally, no. But <laughs> <laughs> sure, it can stay that way. Okay. Um, I'll I'll pick one now. And honestly, looking at this list... It's pretty good. The thing that really sticks in my craw, though, is Case of the Golden Idol and Nobody Saves the World are too low. Way too low for me personally. I don't think they both have to move up, but that was my that's my number one and two of the year. And seeing them that low, especially below like fucking neon white and, and below Tinykin when I don't think Tiny Tinykin's great, but it's not doing as much new as nine and ten. So I don't know that I have a proposal, but I think nine, I think nine and or 10 need to move up. So I will say in case of the golden idols defense, even though I really, really bounced off it, I can appreciate it artistically and intellectually uh, as, as an achievement in its craft where I, I, I would, I would be fine putting it like above tiny kin. I was thinking that too, as number six, I'm, you're going to put it above Signalis? If we're having to make these kind of concessions. I'm not making that kind of concession. I'm fine with where it is. I would move Nobody Saves the World up. So, so Kyle, I think, I think my problem with your argument against Case of the Idol is you were saying this is not your type of game, uh -huh. but that it's also a bad game because of that. And I don't think that's fair because there are plenty of games on here. I don't example, think I ever so, said that for, it was a bad game. But then I why said is my, it at number my, nine? So, for example, it's, it's Citizen, still on the game of the year list. <laughs> for example, Citizen Sleeper, Elden Ring, Neon White, Signalis. That's not my type of the game, but I can at least recognize it's a great game. Other people like it. I'm OK with it being higher. I, I can recognize that you both liked it. I can also recognize that me and Jake didn't. And that's yes. straight down the middle. But objectively, is it a good or a bad game? I think it's a video game that I didn't enjoy playing. I can't. It's a subjective opinion. I didn't get anything out of it that would merit it going higher than where it is. Well, what do you what do you think? I, the, the, just a recap recommendation is Case of the Golden Idol to number six. To number six. Uh, yeah, just above to number or six. below Tinykin. Uh, above Tinykin. Uh, I mean, I can see it. Um, can you check? Um, sorry, can you check your OBS real quick? People are getting buffed. Yeah, it's 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 crapping like crazy. Um, I can't seem to get over a thousand kilobits a second. It's weird. I mean, it's uh, playing still fine kind of on okay. restream, but I don't know why it's just not doing anything. Not just keep going. Frames. Uh, Will, how do you feel about Case of Golden Idol to six? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. Uh, if we want to move it up, Jake. I mean, I do I I do dislike putting it above Signalis, but so I understand. Oh, shit, that's where it is. And Kyle, you would leave it where it is. 
if it has to move up, I would move it up to eight, but that's as high as I would go. Man, I just I think I think it should be above neon white. The reason why I say that is I I feel very firmly that half of neon white is dog shit. <laughs> and no matter how good the other half of the game is, half of it's dog shit. I mean, unfortunately, we had two people who didn't play neon white. So it comes down to my bad, like like it's you versus me on this. And then it's all that's, four that's why I, I would be fine with it being on the list and i'm fine with it being number eight but for case of the golden idol like will both will and i are very strong on that i, I mean okay i it's i i don't think it should be at number six i'll, I'll say that yeah would, that's, that's why I'm, I'm amending it to number seven and we live with number seven i i can live with number seven jake i'm surprised you can that's that's I mean, all I'll yeah, say. It, it's it's it would not have ever cracked my top ten. Um, but like, why aren't you fighting more for that? I do, is I it because I know we've been going for I'm, three hours. No, this I know Ian's that I'm not going to get. I know <laughs> that I'm not going to get Signalis up any higher on the list. I know that I I'm not going to be able to make a case that gets it. Any if you don't I, if you don't fight, it'll get lower. But I think I think selfishly is Jake's got Citizen Sleeper at number five. Kyle, you've got Elden Ring up there. Will, you've got games up there. My number one and two are sitting at nine and ten. I mean, to be fair, your number one was split down the middle, like I said. Like, but I just... don't think I don't think it was split down the middle. It was split down the middle in terms of I love this game and this game ain't for me. But this game ain't for me doesn't mean number ten. It just means abstain. I mean, OK, I, I'm. I would never put Case of the Golden Idol above Tiny Ken. That's that's where I'll, I, I'll I, I I'm saying let's put it at number seven then. OK. We good with that? I can live with that. OK, let me bump it. And then we'll take a look at the list and see if anybody's got any. Um, okay, so let's take a fresh, fresh look at the list. Let's read it out and see how it feels. From 10 to 1, Nobody Saves the World, Signalis, Neon White, Case of the Golden Idol, Tinykin, Citizen Sleeper, Cult of the Lamb, Dwarf Fortress Steam, Elden Ring, and Pentiment. I'd, I'd want to flip Cult of the Lamb and Citizen Sleeper, if possible. I agree. I, th I think I'm okay with that. Cult of the Lamb, the I'm bugs okay were with just that. real fucking bad, man. I'm okay with that. Uh, okay, two seconds. Oh, wait. Okay. Um, that. I'm just going to yeah. say something, and you guys can take it or leave it. It's the only time I'm offering it. It's fire sale as we sit here at... Oh, wait. Kilobytes. They're going crazy. Um uh tiny kin uh to number eight, and you can move case and neon white both up one. I'll take it. Actually, I'll take that I'll take bone. That to nine, you can move signals up as well. <gasps> oh my gosh, Will, you're so nice. But nobody saves the world, stays where it fucking is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with that. Tiny kin's great. I, it's just I not really like tiny. Yeah. I know, yeah. I know no one else liked it. It's my neon white and signals. No. So. No, I really liked it too. It's no, just No, you hated it. Shut up. You're the bad guy. We have, a, we have a banger fucking year here though. This is I I mean, at the end of the day, these are the top 10 games of the year. Everything's making it in. Um yes. I'm it's, really happy with this list. As as it stands right now. I don't Okay, I do have one more thing though. Mm -hmm. uh oh, no. Oh, god. Just just thinking about how everybody talked about it. Should we should we move hard space ship breaker up to 10 and nobody saves the world down? Yes, we should. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't agree, Ian. but I'm sure you guys will do that. <laughs> I, I just because knowing that this is the list we will publish. Nobody saves the world is great, but hard space. It has its problems. But when it when it's working, it's fucking working and it's not getting enough recognition. In the I, really I, good. I would agree with that. Yeah. 
I like that idea. Yeah. All right, me. Let me. I, that. For some reason, I thought those games were like out. I thought they were like we couldn't swap. No, no, we can okay. still swap them. We can okay. still swap them. But I think, I think based on the list we're looking at right now, I, I'm okay with this. Are you guys okay with this? Let's I'm go around the horn. This. I'm okay with this. Kyle's good with this. Jake, are you good with this list? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I, I can't really make any compelling arguments for swapping Signalis and Neon White because I, I did not play Neon White. So I, I couldn't make any arguments in good faith to move it any lower. Um, but yeah, I'm good with this. Will, are you good with this list? Yeah, I'm good with this list. I'm good with this list, too. And I just want to say I am so happy that there is only one triple A game on this list. Like this was a year of banger indies and real fucking solid seven triple A's and worse. Remember Gotham Knights? So I. <laughs> this is a great list. I think this represents everybody. We've got a good mix. Everybody's happy with where things are in terms of nobody's stuck at the bottom of the list or off the list. I think we lock it. Are we locking it? Let's lock it. Finally, let's lock it. Uh, Will. <clears throat> You want to give the final the final read through? Yeah, sure. Uh, folks, apologies for the bit rate, but the YouTube copy will be perfect. Um, at number 10, we have Hard Space Ship Breaker. At number nine, we have the secret game of the year, Tinykin. At number eight. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. At number eight, we have Signalis. Number seven, Neon White. Number six, The Case of the Golden Idol. Number five, Cult of the Lamb. Number four, Citizen Sleeper. Number three, Dwarf Fortress Steam Edition. Number two, The Great Elden Ring. And number one, Subpixels Game of the Year 2022, Year of Our Lord, is Pentiment. I just want to say, last year we took it piss easy and Inscription was the obvious winner and we all agreed on that. I think we did a really good job of three hours of discussion from 22 games down to 10 in ranked order. And we have just an incredible compromise list. Every single game on this list is a banger. And I'm very happy with what we did here, gentlemen. I like it. I um, I would like to say in regards to last year, it is a lot easier to pick the game of the year than it is to pick the top 10. The top games 10 of the year. Yeah. <laughs> and I would also and like to say, I think actually, we all did very I, well. I, I, I don't know. know. We had a we had a we had a fight about Elden Ring. We had a fight. No, there. no, 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 no. I get yeah. that. But if we had only done one and two, would have been way easier. Um, I think we all Ace. did great. There were some heated <laughs> moments, obviously, because subjective and objective get crossed. Uh, and Ian loves to argue. And it's not a personal thing I've noticed over the years, but you feel like it is. So I thank you for no one for going to Ian's house and shooting him. Um, folks. Uh, yeah, we'll put out a tweet of our games of the year. Uh, if you didn't already see it, all of our lists were up on the Twitter as well. Fantastic list from each one of us. Uh, closing thoughts. Let's start with Kyle. I'm satisfied. I, I am happy with this list. I think every single game on there, except for one, is respectable. And uh, I can live with it for the rest of my life. And looking back on it, I think we'll, we'll remember this as a very good year for video games. Jake. I think Citizen Sleeper still has one more free DLC on the way. Um, <laughs> it's free DLC, folks. If it's, it's bad, free. we get to move it down the list, though. That's oh, the uh, <laughs> Ian Gibson. <laughs> um, I just want to say this is our first year doing a true game of the year. We have literally been doing this since December of 2021 in terms of planning out this process. And I just want to say thank you, gentlemen, so much for embracing it, for putting games on the nomination list throughout the year and trying to play as many of these games as possible. Because because of that, even though uh, two of you are absolute cowards when it comes to Case of the Golden Idol, <laughs> you played it. <laughs> you I was played the one it. fighting for it. Jake, you didn't do shit. <laughs> I know, you I'm played sorry. it, and I really appreciate that that it. brought a great discussion as opposed to me or just Will or just one of us coming in here and trying to make a case for a game that nobody played. And I think that's the whole point is we are discussing this. We're trying to figure out the site top 10, and I'm so happy that we all embrace the process and we try to play as many of these games as possible to have this incredible three-hour discussion. 
yes, folks, thank you so much. Uh, save data for the raid. Um, it was save data, right? Yeah, thank you for yeah. that. Thank you, everyone who was hanging around uh, and checking this out. This is our official list. Um, I will reiterate what Ian said, but it is incredible to see only one AAA game on here. Uh, that's really neat, and I like that um, all of us together can create a really cool list like this. Um, there are so many games on this list I discovered because of Jake or Kyle or Ian. Yep. Or uh, yeah, so it's great, and I love the stuff we do. Uh, we will be back this weekend with some Dwarf Boys, possibly, or possibly, possibly. Goldeneye, or possibly Hitman Freelancers out. So we can always Ooh. hit that as well. Uh, Hitman World of Assassination. Um, folks, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you all this weekend. Bye.